Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, another, another, I'd like to I'd like to welcome everyone again to, to uh, our our breakfast this morning and into add to Chicago. So, I hope everyone's had a good breakfast, and we uh, we have a have a interesting speaker I think for you this morning. He's uh, actually a personal friend of mine. Uh, we we went all the way through high school and and college together, and and have had had a lot of, lot of good times together, and so. I'm pleased to be able to share, share with you John Restack. He's uh, chairman of the board and president of Growmark, and he's going to be talking about the most studied field in the world, along with some other comments. So enjoy. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, please go ahead and continue with your breakfast. I know this is a, uh, uh, an important part of the morning, so go ahead and, 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 and eat. I really enjoyed being part of your uh, program last night and, and listening to, uh, to the passion. Uh, what a beautiful setting to be talking about soil conservation, looking over, over the lake. Um, and that's, that's a great passion and, and interest in, in soil conservation and in a group of people doing the right thing. And that's, that's always important to us. So I'm a little bit uncomfortable this morning talking to you because normally when I go out and talk to people, I'm talking about Growmark as a cooperative, cooperative system in general. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about that. Uh, but I'm really gonna be speaking about something else. And I'm gonna be talking about a research project that I've been involved with for a long time, how I got it started with this project, some of the findings from it. And I think some of the implications about how bringing people together that don't normally come together to solve problems in agriculture can be pretty important to us as our, as our future moves forward. And so that's gonna be the theme of the things I'm going to be talking about. So with that, let's go ahead and get the uh, first uh, slide up if we can do that. Um, okay, so back in, um, back in March, I was given the opportunity to testify in front of the Senate um, uh, Agriculture Nutrition uh, Committee about a farmers and their ability to manage and deal with climate change. Um, and so, uh, so that's an interesting opportunity for anybody to testify. Now, now this one was a remote hearing, of course, we were still in the COVID lockdowns at, at, at that particular time. And I was representing, I was representing um, uh, Growmark as, as a cooperative, uh, representing the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, which is our trade organization in Washington, D.C. Um, and farm cooperatives around, uh, around North America, around the world are a pretty important part of the fabric of agriculture. Um, National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, it would be supply cooperatives like, uh, like Growmark would be represented there, but also the dairy uh, cooperatives uh, you know, are part of that and some of the consumer product uh, cooperatives like, like an ocean spray. So it's a little bit of a challenge to craft a message that, that works well uh, across that, that large environment. Um, and then, of, of course, uh, to talk about Growmark specifically and what our plans are uh, for, for dealing with, with climate change and some of the other things that are going on in the farm. Uh, and then talk about my personal stories um, in that. So when you, uh, when you do a testimony like this, you do spend some time in preparation. And you spend some time with the committee staff. They're, they're going to do some interviews with you. They're not going to tell you what to say, but they want to know what you're going to say because they want to make this the most effective hearing that's possible, you know? And of course, that's what I wanted to do, make it the most effective uh, uh, committee hearing possible from my standpoint, and most important, not embarrass myself or anybody else that, that's, that's testifying uh, or listening to my testimony. So in this interview process with the committee staff, um, and let, let me just say how impressed I was about the committee staff, the quality of the individuals, the quality of the conversations, and the questions. These were smart, smart young people that know a lot about agriculture, know a lot about farming, and they knew a lot about agronomy. Several of them, several of them uh, had degrees in agronomy, in fact, some advanced degrees. So they knew what they were talking about uh, in, this, in this preparation. So what was I gonna tell them about? Well, I was gonna to talk to him about, about Growmark as, as a cooperative system. You know, Growmark, uh, when I talk about a cooperative system, that's a partnership between Growmark uh, corporately and the member cooperatives that own us. Um, we are a major supplier of agronomy um, inputs in North America, one of the largest. Uh, for example, we would have about 570 retail agronomy locations that fly the FS flag. 
Uh, but more important than those 570 retail agronomy locations is the fact that we have literally thousands of, of, of employees that are dealing with farmers every day. Uh, and these are smart employees. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of them are certified crop specialists, uh, agronomists. Uh, they are not only just selling products to farmers, but they're providing advice and consultation on millions of acres. And so we believe, we believe that we have not only a role, but a responsibility in helping farmers sustain their operations, be successful into the future, but also deal and manage with climate change. And that's the message I wanted to deliver. We will be at the table because we can influence what happens on the farms around this, this country in a kind of a unique way that may not be possible when you, when, uh, with, with some of the other participants with this. Okay. Um, so as I was talking to, um, as I was talking to the, the, the Senate staff talking about what Gromark did, uh, I said, I do have this other part of my life. You know, I am a farmer from Champaign, Illinois. And um, I've been involved in a research project for a long time with NOAA, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And we've been studying some things about climate change. Would you like for me to be part and include that as part of the, of the conversation? And, and the answer was yes, very much they wanted me to do that because this is exactly where they were headed in this, in this hearing. Uh, they started asking me questions that frankly I couldn't ask about what had been going on in the farm with the research project. So, so, um, so I called up um, uh, my, the principal investigator in this project, uh, Tilden Myers from NOAA, and I said, can you help me put together a briefing document that we can supply to the Senate that I can use in my testimony, but also help them prepare for the kinds of questions that are coming our way. So a few days later, um, I get this in the, in the email. Uh, this is the, the, the cover page. It says the most studied agricultural field on the planet. Now, the really is me adding that in because I, I called him out. And I said, is this really true? And the answer is yes, it is true. Uh, and I was really shocked because I'd be honest with you, I'd lost control of what was going on in some of my fields with this stuff. We had people showing up and doing things and uh, we, we had a disciplined process at the beginning, but it just got to be the point where, where um, uh, that didn't work anymore. So some of, the, some of the numbers that I think are kind of impressive about this, that I'm just gonna take a second and, and read this uh, for you, is on this site in that 25 years, we have collected over 8 billion data points on this farm, 8 billion. Uh, it's me contributing things like yield uh, data and planning information, but there's all sorts of other kinds of research uh, sensors and everything that are being set up in this in this field. Um, the data itself has been downloaded over 1900 times by researchers and it's been cited about 385 times in scientific research. So it has gotten some traction the things that are going on in this field. I'm not going to take a lot of responsibility for these things because I am not a scientist and I don't understand everything that's going on out there, but I have been a pretty passionate observer of the things that they're doing. Um, so over this period of time, it's not just Noah, it's not just me. We've opened this up and we said to, to researchers, you know, if you have a well-constructed research plan, uh, and you're respectful to the other researchers and respectful of what happens in the farm, you're welcome to come and spend time on the farm and do the things you want to do. And so they have shown up over time. Well, why, why do they show up? Well, part of it is the fact because as you start accumulating data and you have information available, it can make their research go much quicker and much less expensive. They don't need to recreate climatology data because NOAA's already doing that. They can access it, okay? Um, they don't need to have the, uh, and find a farmer that's gonna cooperate in supplying yield data or soil test data because I'm already putting it into the system. So they can basically just bolt on um, and, 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 uh, and make their research faster and, and more efficient. Um, so, uh, so in this process, we have had a lot of other people that have shown up at the farm. This is, a, this is not an exhaustive list. There's some others that are on here um, that, that have participated in some of the research on the farm. So for example, with NASA, NASA was looking at, um, they had, a, they had uh, the Landsat satellites. They were looking at things like root growth. Uh, so uh, so they, um, they had a, a contract with the University of uh, Wisconsin. The researchers came down and they started installing instruments uh, on, on the field uh, to, to see how Landsat can measure root growth in, in a field. 
the data was available from NOAA on the weather things. My planting information was there. And, and this is how this all kind of evolved. And so every one of these little organizations has got a story to tell here. So how did this, how did this project get started? And what I would like to tell you, what I would like to tell you was that there was a group of us that sat down in an office and said, you know, we're going to design the most studied field in the world. Um, but I will tell you that's not what happened. This happened by, by accident, and it was started at a very unlikely source. It came from a request from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Yeah, I see some people going like, what's that, you know? Well, back in the early 1990s, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, there was a handful of those across the United States. They were looking at really, really um, uh, using supercomputers, but communication systems um, and doing research on those. Now, understand this was pre-internet. Well, the internet was there, but it was, it was, it was military and it was, it was higher education that was using it. Um, but National Center for Supercomputing, located in Champaign, Ur Urbana, was looking at, at communication systems and computing technology and how that could be applicable to society in general. Okay. So Larry Smarr, the, um, the director, challenged the community. He said, you know, let's build a prototype community of the future with communications. Okay. Um, and and, and, and the, the rationale was that they had really smart data scientists. They had really smart computer scientists but they didn't know how society was going to use the powers that they were developing in engineering, okay? And so the best way to do that would be to interface with society, with the various groups in the community to, to understand how this all works. So what they did was they set up um, subcommittees. And so you had a banking committee and a higher education committee and a, and a, a, a local government committee. And, and these committees would come together. Uh, they would interface with, with uh, the data scientists and the people in NCSA. They'd have conversations uh, about how, what the technology looked like and then how it might get used. One of the committees was the Ag Committee. And I'm, I'm proud to say that of any of the committees that are out there, I, without any question, the, in, the Ag Committee, uh, grasped what was happening, and NCA was, as, it was, was, was proud of the development that came out of the Ag Committee. So, so why did that happen? Um, well, okay, now, now go back to 1993 when this happened. Uh, well, today there's 1.7 billion websites approximately on the, on the World Wide Web today. When we started this project, there were 623, okay? And so the internet was, was theoretical, it wasn't, it wasn't real. Um, and so, um, so our group, um, the NCSA offered assistance uh, in forming this, this network. Uh, the subcommittees, as I said, were, were, were being informed. It was an opportune time in agriculture. Uh, the early 1990s, the first thing that was opportune and made it, made it work well was farmers were used to working with higher education. I mean, we've had extension on our farms our whole lives. That doesn't exist with other segments of the, of, of the community. It doesn't happen in uh, necessarily even in education or banking or whatever. So this idea that you're gonna work with smart people uh, on a university level is not novel to farmers. So, so we were very accommodating to that. We were seeing um, the birth uh, and the explosion of precision farming, lots of data, uh, that was being collected. And actually Champaign-Urbana was one of the places where this was being pioneered, okay? Um, we also saw, um, knew that, that farmers were interested in more information on their farms. I mean, every farm back in those days, or a lot of farms had satellite dishes. They weren't to, you know, to download, a, to watch direct TV or dish network. They were information terminals. You know, you had a screen sitting in your office and you're getting weather information, you're getting all these kinds of things. So all of these convergences uh, came together. Uh, and so you put really smart data scientists in a room full of farmers, okay? And you talked about what each of you did. One of my, one of my fondest memories uh, was sitting in my kitchen with a German nuclear physicist, true story, German nuclear physicist, who was on sabbatical and NCSA um, from Los Alamos Laboratory. He was intrigued with precision farming data. He had written a computer program a few years earlier for one of the Japanese automobile manufacturers that predicted the quality of paint finishes on a car based on input of parameters. What was the temperature? What, was, what were you painting? What was the kind of paint? All of these things. And it generated a, a, a quality index for, for paint. He said, I think I can take this program 
and predict crop yields. He said, I'll just substitute yield at the other end of this. We'll put the ag uh, inputs onto the other side of this, and we'll get a model for predicting yields, okay? And he tried to do it, but it didn't work. And he kind of threw his hands up, and he said, it's just too complex. So think about that. A nuclear physicist is saying it's too complex. Well, why is it too complex? We know all the things that go into predicting yield. We also know that we don't measure a lot of them, do we? And even if you do measure them, what do they mean? An inch of rain in July means something different than an inch of rain in, in March, for example. And it all means something different depending on when you plant it and what the crop is. So we are talking about a very, very complex system in agriculture uh, that we don't have good modeling for because we're not collecting enough data. Okay. So our group came together um, with the NCSA people and we said, this is great stuff. And we, wanted, we want to, uh, to expose more farmers around the country uh, to, to the technology that's out there. And we put together a conference. It was called the InfoAg Conference. Um, and the InfoAg Conference was the first convergence of the internet and precision farming. We did it uh, back in, in 1995 at Cranert. That conference is still going on. It's in St. Louis here in, in, in early August. Um, we made up websites, frankly. There were no websites, and so to demonstrate it, we mocked them up, um, came in, it actually worked. Uh, it, was, it was held together with string and mirrors, but it, but it did work. One of the things I agreed to do would be a, to be a guinea pig is I, I put together a, a website. It was called CyberFarm, where we put some of the data from my farm, some of the things that were going on, and so it was the, the first ag farm site on, on the internet. Uh, it came out of this whole thing. Um, we started to get a lot of requests for precision farming data. Uh, from researchers, from companies. They couldn't research precision farming because they didn't have data. Um, and so this was, again, early in the internet. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't send a file to somebody with precision farming. It was too large. We're talking about, you know, dial-up uh, modems, you know, 14.4 modems for some of you that remember those things. And it could take, it could take uh, an hour to download a picture, and we couldn't do a precision farming. So they set up a, 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 a protocol where we could load data on there. People could sign up. And, uh, and download data for research projects. And that's, that's what we had here was, were data files that we put onto the internet. Uh, and we had a lot of traction, 150 downloads, lots of states, but four, 15 foreign countries, you know. So there was a quest for data and people wanted more data. They wanted more data. So one of the principals in this group uh, was Dr. Harold Reitz. Um, Dr. Harold Reitz worked at the Potash and Phosphate Institute at the time. Uh, he was a uh, Purdue, um, um, Ag, uh, uh, in, in ag extension for many, many years. He said, John, I've got a couple of uh, uh, former grad students that are senior data scientists that are dealing with, uh, with climate, wet, uh, climate and agronomy. And they're looking for a place to put a, um, a, a climatology station. Would you be willing to, to volunteer uh, for on a short-term basis to, to put this, this site into, into place? And so, um, so I met with Tilden um, uh, from uh, NOAA, Steve Hollinger's Illinois Water Survey, and uh, we agreed that we'd allow them to do a, a semi-permanent site on, on the farm. Um, you're, uh, you're all familiar with what NOAA does. Uh, they are doing cutting edge research all around the world on, on climate studies. Uh, but this was also about, about ag agronomy and, and, and agriculture. This was part of a larger study worldwide. Uh, looking out things like greenhouse gases. Uh, it was called the Ameriflux Project because it, it, this one encompassed uh, 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 North America, Central America, and South America. A series of this kind of data that was going to be collected in different environments to understand what was happening. You know, we're, we're early in this, this global warming um, um, greenhouse gas thing in the, in, in the, in the early 1990s. So this is, this is fairly early. And this was actually part of an international study where they were looking at collecting this kind of data everywhere. So, so NOAA was, was, was really out there. Uh, what were they doing? They were looking at the carbon cycle. And you're all familiar with the carbon cycle. What we're all not familiar with is the fact that it, it is very different depending on the environment that it's, that it's growing in. Um, this is just a map showing the different sites that across uh, across North, Central, and Southern America uh, that are part of this uh, Meriflux project. If you go to the next slide, there's my little farm uh, as, as a contributor to it. What I was interested in this is that most ag research focuses on the impact of the environment on growing crops. This research was focused on the impact of growing crops on the environment. You know, what I do in my field, what you do in your fields affects what happens 
you know, within the field, but it affects what happens to your neighbors and it affects what happens around the world. I was thought about that last night as I was listening to people talk about the Dust Bowl. I mean, that's a perfect example, isn't it? Farming practices in the West, um, you know, uh, affected the environment all across the United States. Uh, we're seeing that today with with the smoke that's that's showing up here. So, so you know, um, this is a worldwide a worldwide event that we're dealing with here, and so I, I like that a lot. And 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 bring it to the fact there was a, there was another story that that, that 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 as we were talking about this, they said you know one of the things we're we're going to look a little bit at in this thing is 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 the effect of irrigation in Nebraska on production in your field. I mean, what what does what does production in Nebraska have to do with John Restock's cornfield? Well, Nebraska, you're pulling water out of an aquifer. Okay, you pull that water out of the aquifer, um, uh, plants transpire, it puts water vapor into the atmosphere. The water vapor can be cloud content, which can reduce the amount of sunlight and be negative on photosynthesis, but it might also um, mean get more rainfall. What happens if, uh, if, if less water vapor, because you're gonna do less irrigation, what does, it, does that affect? What's happening in your fields? I don't know that they have an answer to that, but that's the kind of stuff that they're 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 looking at is is these large macro things and how they they can be drilled down to to local areas. So one day, um, a bunch of white vans saying Department of Energy show up. Um, they start unloading equipment, and building a tower out in my field. Now, if your neighbors are a little suspicious about some of the things you do. <laughs> and you have a bunch of white vans that say DOE and they start building a tower out in the middle of your field, they get really suspicious pretty quick. I wish we would have had a video of, of, the, of the pickup trucks circling the section, you know. Uh, we didn't have that. You know, it wasn't a black helicopter moment, but it was about as close as I'm ever gonna get. So anyway, they, they start to put this tower up. And, and the reason you're putting a tower up is you're looking at the environment, not only, you know, at the ground level, but you're putting it way up, up into the air. You can see there's solar panels that are there because you have to have electricity, obviously. Uh, you gotta have electricity 24 hours, 24-7, uh, so you have big battery packs, uh, automobile battery packs that you're doing there. Uh, we were early, so a lot of data loggers, um, they were trying to do some cellular communications. Um, and, and, and so this, uh, this uh, all, uh, all showed up in, in, in the field, and this was the work that was going on. And when I say um, uh, semi-permanent, this was, they, were had, they had annual funding for this project, annual funding for this project. Some of the problems, um, uh, solar panels are not very reliable, okay? And we're gonna get into some of the, the nitty gritty of the research. Uh, solar panels are not very reliable. So you can get into the winter time when the batteries can't put out a lot of power, you're not getting a lot of solar radiation, uh, you can run out of power. Um, people will steal solar panels and automobile batteries. <laughs> Um, they will do that. It's happened at least once. I will tell you that is a federal crime, and the FBI does investigate that, but it's not a real high priority, to be honest with you. Um, and these, uh, these, these boxes and these, this stuff, well, one of the things it did is it, it started to attract a lot of rodents, okay? And you know what, what, what mice and electronic devices, what happens with it? They, 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 they get into things, they make a mess of things, they chew up wires. But one of the things we weren't expecting was the fact that the mice attracted predators. It, effect, it attracted hawks, it attracted owls. And so we had a problem with one owl that would get up on top of these instruments. Um, it would grab a mouse, it would eat it. What it didn't want to eat, it would drop and it would fall down into the instruments. And it would have uh, owl droppings that would get down into the instruments. And, and so we weren't recording what was happening in the field, we were recording what was happening in the ingestion system of the owl, okay? Um, so, so long term, they had to do research, a, a way to, to build new instruments to make this work better. In the short term, what do you do if you're a researcher? You assign a graduate student <laughs> to go out and clean the instruments. I'm not sure if that ever ended up on somebody's uh, resume, their CV, but, but they were doing it on a fairly routine basis until we could work through this problem. Um, but this was basically a, 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 an annual kind of a product. Um, but I got a call from them saying, you know what, we, we're going to, we'd like to have permission to trench a power line all the way across the field and a telephone line. Um, we've got secure funding for this project long term. And I said, well, how did that happen? They said, well, you know, we have a few years of data 
And the weather forecasting models always make assumptions about what's happening in a cornfield or a soybean field, and they plug those assumptions into the model. What we did was we took the actual results that were being um, gathered from your field, plugged it into the model, and we got a little bit better weather forecasting, a little bit better weather forecasting. And that's secured funding. And to this day, the data from this farm is flowing into both the US and the European models in the forecasting models. What's happening in the field, affecting the environment as a whole, making uh, science better. Um, so uh, you've got a picture of the, uh, of the larger tower that, that went in there with all the instruments that are there. This was, this was tower two. There's about five different devices over, over a period of time. This is tower number two. Um, Another picture of it showing it on a trailer and, um, 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 and, and the devices. Remember now, when you're seeing the tower, it's kind of like an iceberg or a tree. You only see what's above ground, and it actually is a lot of stuff below ground. It goes in different, different directions. Again, one of the problems we started getting into is you built these towers out and you build them, you can only farm so close to them. And so you try to plant the crops underneath the tower so they're getting a representative view of what's actually going on in the field. The problem with that was... Uh, um, it's really hard to get a good stand and it's not representative under a tower as it would be over, over the field. And so weeds would come through and I'm quite sure there was a year or two where we were looking at the photosynthetic of, event of giant foxtail and giant ragweed more than we were looking over, over the photosynthesis of corn and soybeans. So the idea came is, well, what about just building a portable tower? And so that's what this is. It's, it's, it's a portable tower. Um, it's on a wagon running gear of all things. Um, and so it, it's there. Uh, when it comes time for, for me to plant, they come out, they unhook all the devices, uh, they drag it uh, to a waterway that's across the, the field. Uh, I plant, they get done, I get done, they drag it back over, hook up all the devices, and then the crop grows up underneath it. If I need to spray the field, they can, they can pick it up and they move it. Um, uh, it, it takes some work, you know, some coordination, um, you know, uh, to get this all done, but, but it works, it works pretty well. Harvest time, you know, I harvest up to it. They yank it out of the field and I harvest the rest of it. And we, we, we come back on this whole thing. You know, they, they understand the, 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 you know, the timing is always a problem. The vagaries of, of farming are there. I will say that when you have several PhD meteorologists, they can pretty much predict when you're gonna be able to get in the field, uh, and, and, and provide some, uh, some assistance with that. So, so that's how this tower functions right now. Uh, uh, the main tower, and then there could be devices scattered all the way across the field. Uh, all sorts of different kinds of sensors um, that, are, that are attached to it. Uh, they're taking a look at, uh, at uh, reflectance and, and photosynthesis, and, and uh, I don't understand what all these things are. There is one thing I do want to take a second about is, is talk about how do you actually measure uh, uh, photosynthesis and CO2 in, in an environment like this? I mean, most of us would think, well, you take soil tests to, to do that. You, you take a look at the amount of organic matter that's accumulating, and you can do that, but that gets pretty, that gets difficult. I mean, how deep do you soil test to look for, 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 for carbon, organic carbon? Is it six inches? Is it six feet, you know? And, and, and your sampling pattern, and, and you can only do it a few times a year, it's too complicated. So what they do with this is, is they measure the CO2 with something called a, a, an eddy covariance device. And it is pretty cool. Um, you basically have a, a gas analyzer that you know, 10 times a second looks for the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, what is the concentration, you know, 10 times, a, 10 times a second. Then it has an anemometer, which measures is the air flowing up or is it flowing down? Okay, so if you know the concentration and you know if is it flowing up or down over a period of time, you can predict that if it's flowing down, then the crop and the soil is a carbon sink. If it's flowing up, you're, you're, you're moving carbon from, from the field or the crop into the environment. And you do that over a period of time and you can start to predict uh, how much carbon sequestration is going on in, in, a, in a field, okay? Uh, you have sensors like this that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, they're looking down through the crop since it's growing up through there. Uh, you have uh, uh, another, just some more pictures of some of the, uh, some of the de devices and the sensors that are out there. Um, you get the idea of this. Uh, they do uh, scatter some other devices throughout the field like this. Uh, the goal always is that those all get picked up before you harvest. Uh, they do make an awful lot of noise when they go through the combine. Not much damage, but a lot of noise. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that. 
Uh, so now what they basically do is they treat it like a surgeon does when he does surgery. They count the number of devices. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of the year, they want to make sure they got the right number of devices sitting on the end of the field is what they put out in the, in the field. Uh, and so, uh, so they, they, they show up and they get scattered. Uh, there was a period of time when um, we were trying to do um, uh, corn and soybeans that got to be too, uh, they just didn't have the, the, the resources to do uh, measurements of both corn and soybeans, but, but, but they did try that. So we're just basically monitoring the crop that's being planted in the field right now. There are some cool devices that show up out here. This is one of them I like. Uh, it looks like something from the movie Twister, you know, uh, but it's actually just a snowfall. Uh, measurement tool. Those baffles uh, deflect the snow as it blows across the field, so these you can measure measure that. Um, and of course, this is operating, you know, year round. Um, and one of the things you're looking at here is is here solar radi radiation. You know, we we got a lot of solar radiation coming off the fields. Uh, not much photosynthesis going on. A lot of solar radiation. Okay, so what are some of the findings? So, so what are some of the findings here? Let me let me just get to my notes here so that I can get those to you accurately. Um, over this period of time, over this period of time, what they have measured in my field is over the 25 years, with just my normal farming practices, and there's nothing exceptional about my farming practices, we have sequestered on average about 1,000 pounds of carbon a year using these measurements, okay? When you compare that to some other instruments that they have at the University of Illinois South Farms that are in more conventionally tilled, and, and you understand when you're in a, in a research, they do a lot of tillage for those. They're actually burning about 2,000 pounds of carbon a year. Now, we didn't, we didn't look at this as a way to, to decide how to optimize carbon sequestration. This is just, you know, John Restacks, normal, you know, no till sometimes, a little bit of tillage other times, uh, corn, soybean rotation. This is what, what, what came out of it. So that's pretty interesting that, that just normal good farming practices can sequester. And if somebody says, well, does it really, can you really do that? We've got really good data now that we can say, yeah. You know, I can hold up my hand in front of a Senate committee and say, yeah, we know, we know that, that I'm, my practice is sequestering carbon. Um, some things that we know and some things we don't know. We know the CO2 levels in my field have increased from about 360 parts per million to 416 parts per million in the last 25 years. I'm not editorializing. I'm just saying that's what the instruments show, where it's coming from, how it's coming uh, in, in, into that. We do know that, that car, CO2 levels are increasing in my environment. We also know, which I think is interesting, that corn in my field at peak photosynthesis, think right now, is sequestering more carbon than any other environment in the entire Ameriflux network. More than the rainforest, more than the prairie lands, more than anything else. Corn is an extremely efficient at, at sequestering and uh, carbon through photosynthesis. Um, and we know, uh, we know also that soybeans are not very good at it, that we actually backtrack when we grow soybeans. We may actually lose more carbon into the atmosphere than we would sequester. But on a corn-soybean rotation, we're looking at this long term. We, we, we've got a good results from that. Um, carbon, as I say, uh, corn is a really efficient. Um, you know, in 2001, they put a new set of instruments in the field. And uh, they took them out and they installed them, and they were looking. Um, they were they were looking for those to say about a 350 parts per million CO2, but all they could get in in, in the corn canopy was about 320 parts per million. So they thought there was something wrong with the instruments. They took them back, they recalibrated them, brought them back out. So basically, if you think about that, the environment within the field, we were we were sucking about 30 parts per million of CO2 out within that cornfield canopy. That that's pretty impressive. Um, we don't know how long we can sequester this carbon. I mean, a, a thousand pounds a year, can that go on for another 20 years? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know that they know. We, we've not been able to get really good handles on whether organic matter has increased over that time. It's part of it's that sampling thing that we were talking about. Uh, so that's a question we don't know. Uh, the data is going in all sorts of different places, as we talked about a little bit. The Symphona is a, is a project where they're looking at using the sensors on the farm, but also sense, other remote sensing and other things to, to, to build a quality network to, to measure carbon um, um, in, in, in different environments. Okay, Can we standardize with this project? And there's other companies that are doing that. A lot of startup companies are doing this. Uh, it is an example of a private, private uh, public uh, cooperation. You know, this has worked pretty well. It's been a little bit cumbersome, but it is an example um, of how this might all work out for us if we're willing to, to, to take the effort. So now we're going to get over into the editorial part of this. I just got a few minutes here. 
I'm going to make a statement that, that agriculture increasingly will need a license to produce. Okay. I'm not talking about a physical license. Maybe it is. Maybe you're going to have to have a license to, to put on chemicals or fertilizers. But if we're talking about society in, in, in general, we have to have support from society to do the things we want to do. I, I just believe that's true. What am I talking about here? Well, uh, think about a farm bill. You know, you can't, you cannot pass a farm bill today without having the support of a lot of other groups. You've got to have the nutrition people, you know, you got to have the environmental groups. And, and that is all a part of this license. If we want to get meaningful farm legislation, we have to have their support. That's part of the license. Um, I went to Whole Foods for the first time yesterday. You know, Whole Foods has a, uh, an environmental policy and they're going to be dealing with, with growers, but it's not just Whole Foods, it's Walmart. They, they have a, uh, they have that, that policy. They want to be part of the discussion here. Um, one of the things at Growmark that we've learned is how important that is to the people we want to hire as employees. Young people, the people we're trying to recruit, want to work for an ethical company that does the right things. Um, and if, if we don't demonstrate that, that we are doing the right things, then, then they don't want to work for us. And you know, my, my theory very simple is, is if we hire good people, give them good, good opportunities and good tools, uh, they will make us successful. We win. If we don't hire good people, we don't give them those opportunities, we will lose long term. Very simple. So how do you get a license? Well, you tell them you're going to do the right thing. Tell people we're going to do the right thing. You do the right thing. And then you prove that you did the right thing. Pretty simple process, you know. Um, and um, I mean, the STAR program, is that what the STAR program is about, Steve? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that, whole, that whole thing? The challenge is, is how do we know what the right thing is? Because the right thing can change sometimes. We've all seen that in agriculture. So that, that's part of our challenge here is what is the right thing. Um, and um, how are you gonna do that? Uh, you know, well, you're gonna do it with smart people. But the next thing to think a little bit about is, is what are we solving for in agriculture? What do I mean by that? Well, you know, traditionally we all solve for income, you know, uh, production price minus expenses. That is something we solve for. Um, we also know we need to solve for soil and water conservation. And it's another thing that we have to make decisions about for our farm. Um, increasingly, we're asked for water quality, solving for water quality. And now they're talking about climate change. We're going to need to solve for climate change. And then what's going to be next? You know, think about the things we've we solved for in the past. I mean, a few years ago, we would have been talking about, uh, about uh, biofuels. We still solve for that, but it's not, not a priority. And sometimes these things can be um, um, in, contrary to each other. For example, if you want me to solve for climate change and want me to sequester more carbon on my fields, I will tell you that I think the method, the easiest method for me would be to no-till corn on corn year after year with a cover crop. I think that would be what I need to do. But you know, that probably doesn't yield the best income for me, okay? And it probably doesn't improve water quality because we're, we're gonna have to put nitrogen on those fields to, to maximize that photosynthesis. So as we think through this thing, um, you know, what are we gonna be solving for and how do we prioritize it? When you start at the top and this thing, when thinking about the arrow, it's pretty easy to get farmers to talk about income. Soil and water conservation, we know long-term pays, but you know, we have some farmers that, that in the short term won't do soil and water. Um, climate change gets to be less important. So as you move down this hierarchy, um, it gets more and more difficult to convince people to do the things uh, on this list. And that's where incentives and policies get to be really important. So producers can't solve for this by themselves. They're going to have to bring together people in different ways that we've never perhaps ever used before. And that comes back to this collaborative effort of bringing really smart people, getting with agriculture, getting with farmers to help them solve these problems. So uh, let me just give you a little example about something that, that we're seeing at Gromark. So in Gromark, the last few years, we probably have had some type of communications with about 200 companies that are out there. Um, this is just a partial list of some of the logos out there. I will tell you from my experience, I think there's some of those companies that have products and technologies that could revolutionize agriculture. I believe that. I will also tell you that there's companies out there whose technology and products will not work. How does a farmer tell them apart? They all got great logos. They all got beautiful websites, okay? And so that is going to be one of the challenges. Now, in the past, of course, we can rely, we, and we will continue to rely on extension, okay? Extension, 
But, but extension, and they're going to play up an important role in the future, but they just don't have the capacity, the capability to manage through hundreds of companies in the way that you're going to have to manage. So, so one of the things that we're going to be doing at Gromark is, is we're, we're pivoting. We're saying, you know, a base, we were founded for a basic need to meet farmers' needs of supplying good fuel to the farm. We believe in the future that supplying good information and knowledge is going to be a critical part of our success. So we're going to put resources in helping farmers evaluate these different kinds of companies. So we have a program, it's called Ag Validity. It's our testing program. We're engaging those hundreds of agronomists, those locations with progressive farmers where these products can get tested. Uh, in, in, in real world environments. We're attractive to those companies because of, uh, of the fact that we do have a big mass. If they can get us to test it, uh, they can get our brand approval, their product can move into a marketplace. So we've become an attractive um, uh, for them in that process. So we're, we're moving that forward um, and we're building that, that capability out. Um, and then finally, what we're looking at saying is, you know, we, we're also willing to make significant investments in companies you know, uh, venture capital kinds of investments. If that's what it takes to bring really good companies and really good products and get them uh, applied on the farm. So um, in summary here, you know, when you're a farmer, um, you go out and you expect to see something like this in your field, don't you? I mean, that, that, that you know. Um, sometimes when I go out to my field, I'll find something like that. And I have no idea. He didn't speak English. I didn't speak his language. I don't to this day know what he was doing, okay? <laughs> But that's okay. We had a good time talking about it. And then once in a while, you find something like this. But that's a story for a different time and a different place, because that's another interesting story. So with that, I'm out of time. Um, I had a little video to show, but I'm not going to show it because we're out of time. So thank you very much for your attention today. You, you want to? You you okay, can you guys go ahead, just go ahead and play the video for me? So this has nothing to do with anything that you're doing, but it's just kind of, it was fun. This is the today show. That 56 pass, I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that little right. mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it said. I don't always say the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <laughs> Yeah, well, I heard you around or about in the lunchroom. See, there it is. <laughs> Violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean, well, well Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet that Allison? anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big? What do you, how does one, no, what do you write to it? Like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate with, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh, oh, Allison will be in the studio shortly. What is, what is the name? It's a giant computer network made up, made up of uh, starting from... Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a at computer the billboard. It's, it's not a... It's, it, it's, it's a computer billboard, but it's like right. it's, it's several uh, universities that are all joined together. Right. And others can access it. And right. It's, and it's getting bigger and bigger. All the time. Just it came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie, you know, but you don't need, you don't need that. You don't need a phone line to operate. No, internet. no, apparently not. So, Katie. so just think how far we've come. There's a lot of you that remember 1994. There's some of you that, that perhaps don't, but we've come a long way. I think we can go a long way if we're willing to work with other people, perhaps in ways that make us a little uncomfortable. So thank you. You've been a very attentive audience. Thanks, John. Sure. Always appreciate your comments. So uh, we're ready to move on to the next. Where, 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 where are we now, Sarah? Michael, I guess you're up. I don't know about you, that, that was interesting. I hadn't seen anything like that before. So good morning. I hope everybody was at our 75th anniversary last night. That was amazing to have all those past presidents there. So if they're in here, thank you for, for coming. We appreciate that. And which is kind of funny, Steve has just introduced me and I'm gonna introduce Steve. <laughs> 
So um, I'll welcome the NACD Executive Board North Central Representative Steve Steyerwalt to the stage to uh, talk about this morning's efforts. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, in, in, in the program, I was given a chance to, to, to do just a little bit of a welcome uh, for the North Central, uh, the North Central folks here today uh, all, all ha have uh, been, been uh, great to work with. And so I want to, I want to be half of North Central, not just Illinois, North Central and our, the state association, the Association of Soil Water Conservation Districts. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Chicago and uh, where, as we all know, NAC started 75 years ago. Uh, as, as Michael said, you know, uh, we celebrated last night 75 years of accomplishments and, and what, a, what a wonderful evening and, and it was so fun to actually at least see if not meet a lot of the presidents that, you know, were here way before I had a chance to become involved. And so uh, we, 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 talk about, uh, we talked about the accomplishments of the past and, and what, how proud we are of those, but today you know, also, I think we have an opportunity to uh, continue to look to the future. Uh, and what, what, you know, John talked about some of the things, the challenges and stuff like that, but whenever there's a challenge, you know, it, it's, it's an opportunity. And what a great time to be a conservationist. When you see the opportunities that are presented to us right now, it's a fantastic time to be in conservation. With uh, generations growing up now, you know, conservation isn't isn't a, a an option. You know, they expect it, and and so you know, business and industry at all levels are trying to figure out how to to adapt to that. What do they do? So, with a new emphasis on climate smart agriculture, carbon sequestration, sustainability, regenerative, whatever you want to call it, what our conservation districts, our folks, what you do is is as valuable, if not more valuable, and of more interest than it's ever been in my lifetime, surely, and maybe back to the Dust Bowl. So what you do is in demand. <clears throat> Last February at our, <clears throat> excuse me, at our virtual NACD annual meeting, uh, Kevin Norton put it very well, I thought. He said, when we lead locally, we lead successfully. <laughs> Uh, so when we lead locally, we see lead successfully. I thought I thought that was the first time I'd heard anybody put it that way, and I thought it was so succinct and, and important. So how do we as conservation districts and NACD respond? Well, Michael Crowder and NACD are working hard every day to help conservation districts navigate these new opportunities. The Climate Action Task Force, uh, the next generation of cohort, the TA assistance grants are just, just a very tip of the iceberg on, on the things that NACD does for conservation districts every day. And so uh, uh, they, NACD is working on your behalf all the time to, to help find a way to navigate these, these new opportunities. So I, it, it's, it's, it's a personal belief of mine and I hope a lot of you that all conservation is local. If you're gonna make a, uh, have an effect, you know, it's, it's local. The things you do locally that build, just like John was talking about, these things that happen in the local area, they build into something bigger all the time. So, the, so all conservation is local and the local connection is the big advantage that we have as conservation districts. So we are local people developing local solutions to 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 local resource concerns and and i i think it's so exciting because we are positioned better than uh any other organization that i know of to really help make a difference in conservation so uh that's that's the, uh, welcome to chicago okay where, where we go now sarah okay back to michael i didn't bring my whole oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so i do want to I do want to thank Steve and, and uh, Illinois folks. Can can the Il Illinois folks stand up for for hosting us here? So, 
So I can go off script just a bit is that when we put this meeting together, we didn't know if we would be here. We signed a contract and trust me, we were kind of going out on a limb. So it's, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Um, and Illinois took a chance and, and it, it turned out. So moving on, it, I have the pleasure of introducing our MC for today. Uh, her name is Rita Fraser. And um, if you were at the celebration last night, you, you saw her there. And she's been with us before at, at NACD. She is the Director of Network and Audio Services for the RFD Radio Network and Illinois Farm Bureau. She's a full-time farm broadcaster and previously served as president of the National Association of Farm Broadcasting. So please help me welcome Rita. Thank you so much. And we had the Illinois delegation stand up. I'm so impressed with this group, what you do every day, and with what Steve said about starting local. So I'm going to have you stand up again. This time you're going to give yourself, all of you, a standing ovation for what you do every day. Can you do that? Thank you so much. You are making a difference. Our first speaker this morning is joining us virtually from DC. Terry Crosby was appointed to serve as chief of the United States Department of Ag Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, in May of 2021. In this role, chief oversees 3,000 NRCS field offices and their employees across the nation. Terry began his career with the agency in 1979 as a student trainee in Iowa, and his roots run deep. Raised on a cotton farm with his eight siblings in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, Terry's love for the land began at an early age. The farm, now in his family for three generations, was purchased by his great-grandfather in the late 1800s. With that, Chief Crosby. And good morning, and thank you for the invitation. You know, I wish I could be with you all in person today. However, as you know, we're still operating on the COVID restrictions. Who would have ever thought we'd still be operating on the COVID restrictions at this point in time? Despite this, and I've shared with many of you before, our employees continue to meet customer service needs in our conservation mission. I'm proud of our employees. Our accomplishments over the past years couldn't have been achieved without partners like you. I can't stress enough how critical NACD and our work together is in getting conservation on the ground, successfully implementing our Farm Bureau programs, and in helping move our agency and mission forward with this new administration. And we must continue to build on the foundation that we already created, the partnership that we have already forged to meet the challenges ahead. It is our business as usual from the agency's perspective on how, on what our mission and vision is. That has not changed. What has changed in some areas of our operation, the department has expectation that we're going to have to adjust to and in doing so, in some instances, change the way we're doing business. So let's visit about the secretary's and the agency's priority. Climate change, diversity and social justice, urban agriculture and outreach. Climate smart agriculture is the top priority for this administration. Those making their living from the land, our farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners are bearing the brunt of climate change, while communities across the country are suffering hotter and longer droughts, catastrophic wildfires, and extreme weather events. The good news is we have strategies to address these challenges, and they will be locally led. I want to say this again, locally led. Further, we know that our farmers are critical to the overall needs to the, addressing the climate crisis. As you all well know, conservation works best when it's about partnerships and collaboration. In the months ahead, USDA will serve as a leader on using the best science, research, and conservation tools to support producers in building uh, uh, operations across the landscape, mitigating the impact of flooding, drought, wildfire, and other climate-related disasters events 
while ensuring our department is doing its part to support clean air, water, and communities. We will do this through voluntary conservation program, supported by one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to deliver climate smart solutions to working lands across the nation. We've already announced several updates. NRCS is, a, is investing $330 million in 85 locally driven private, public private partnerships to address climate change and other natural resources challenges through the RCPP program. NRCS is also investing $25 million in proposals for on farm trials, part of the Conservation Innovation Grants. Additionally, NRCS allocated $15 million to support the development of new tools, approaches, practices, and technologies to further natural resource conservation on private land through SIG. NRCS recently announced $10 million to support climate smart agriculture and forestry through voluntary conservation practices in 10 pilot states. This funding will be available through the Environmental Equip Program, EQIP. We announced a target pilot for our EQIP incentive program, contract program, targeting four Western states with a focus on drought. We'll be talking to, taking the feedback we receive from states and incorporating it into a nationwide rollout for program year F522. By increasing incentives and market opportunities that reward producers and landowners for implementing climate smart agriculture and forestry practices, USDA will empower farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners to be part of the climate solution while improving their economic returns. You are also been hearing a lot about renewed focus on diversity and social justice. Secretary Valesat had let all USDA employees know from day one of his tenure that we are in a new era of renewed special emphasis on civil rights to all employees and customers in our day-to-day -day work. For clarity, there is social justice and there is equality. NRCS has a long history of working across all races, gender, social distancing, individuals, partners, and groups. However, as you know, in the past, there has been areas of discrimination which are still, and we're still answering to today. Let me give you an example of, rec of the recommendations and some of the commitments from the agency, our partnership engagement and opportunities with our 1890 institutions and our 1994 outreach efforts. We're taking a close look at our programs and our services to ensure our programs are accessible and that we are reaching pr producers who have previously been unable to come to NRCS for assistance. This will take partnerships and collaborations, and I look forward to working with all of you as we do this work. Urban agriculture is very important. The work we're doing in the space of agriculture and outreach is a, it's a great example of working towards equality for all. For example, to inst institutionalize support for urban agriculture, the 2018 Farm Bureau directed USDA to set up a new Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovation Production. NRCS has been the leading agency tasked with this effort. I have to commend all of our partners and staff who have been involved in this heavy lift. While the office is housed within, US, within NRCS, we know it is a department-wide effort, and we're working closely with our partner agencies to ensure coordination on our urban agriculture strategies. We're in the process of expanding our outreach division as appropriate to meet this anticipated urban demand. We have also hired a national program manager and we will hire a national director really soon. I will tell you that urban agriculture is not new to us. As my time in Ohio for 16 years and 12 of those 12 of those 16 years, work very closely with some of our urban cities to look at these areas where we have food deserts. You know that a lot of our folks want to grow local and buy local, and we want to help them do that. So look forward to some of the, some great innovation and some great things that are going to be happening in the urban area. Hiring and a lot of things what I hiring also. You know, we have a hiring strategy uh, at USDA. We're in the midst of hiring 1,500 new employees. I would tell you that we, we are being very successful there. And some of the things that we're thinking right now to accomplish even getting our staff numbers up a little bit higher, got some good news. We are making great strides in doing this. Overall, staffing cap is 11,011. That's where we were trying to get to, as shown in the 22 president budget. Right now, we're at 10,445. We hope to get there real soon. You know, 90% of our staff is at the field level, and that's where the rubber meets the road. 
We want you to know that we're going to continue to staff up at our field levels and make sure we have the capable staff to work alongside a lot of our partners, especially our districts, as we move ahead and get conservation put on the ground. The other thing I'd like to say is, is that we can't do this work alone. We need to, we need partnerships and we need your help to get this work completed. We're going to be asked to do a lot more into the future. And the only way we're going to get this done is through partnerships. And it is great being a partner, you know, throughout my 42 years as a employee of USDA, I've had great working relationship with our partners, especially the soil and water conservation districts provide a great service to the folks of this country, the local led process. And we want to continue that partnership. And thank you all for being such great partners. Wish I could be there in person. Um, hopefully, as uh, we get COVID under control, uh, we'll be able to do a lot more stuff in person. But uh, much success for your meeting. Um, and I know that you're having a great time there in Chicago. And, and the meeting is going great. And I just want to say uh, have a lot of respect for this organization. Thank you for the work that you do and your leadership is great. We've been working very closely together and I just want to just say thank you and look forward to seeing you down the road. Again, thank you for the invitation and again, wish I could be there in person. Thank you so much to a very sincere chief there. I really appreciate those comments. One of the Illinois Association's crown jewels is the STAR program, Saving Tomorrow's Agriculture Resources. First up to tell you a little bit about that program is Champagne SWCD STAR coordinator, Bruce Hendrickson. Bruce? Good morning. I'm so glad to be here and have an opportunity to talk a little bit about STAR. So my purpose is to just clarify what is STAR. Many of you are familiar with what we do and what it is. Some of you are not. So we're going to do the very quick version of this. And if I can see all the slides so I know what I'm doing, then we'll be fine. Is this a little card right here? Uh, OK, wonderful. Uh, very simply, we'll go ahead. Do I control that here? Sorry, Sarah. That one? Okay. Yes, STAR began because of farmers, which is, again, goes back to what the theme you've heard this, this morning from a number of places, which is about local impact on the conservation. So Champaign County, of course, is where it started because of two farmers, Joe Rothermel and Steve Steerwall who had this concern, especially after the uh, publication of the Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy for Illinois in 2015. They were already concerned enough to be leaders uh, on our board, kind of taking turns between being the chair and the, and the vice chair. Uh, but very simply, they were doing some things themselves, but were concerned that maybe some of their neighbors weren't doing all the things they could do and should do. In fact, one of the concerns then is if farmers didn't step up and make those changes themselves, someone else might force them to do that. And as has been mentioned by John this morning, maybe it becomes a license to do certain things. Or as I, last night, I was really impressed by some of the history of the founders of the NACD. In particular, I wrote down a quote from Robert Ruder, which said, we need to do something before and without the government clubbing us. What a quote because that's still a concern by some of us. So as you see here, um, we have to take a look at, am I not getting the right thing going here? There we go. So this two smaller words for you to read, don't worry about that, very simply, we know that conservation is now expected as was alluded to by several today about potential employees. New employees are expecting conservation to be done. And it, whether it's in agriculture or other areas of environment. And very simply, we know that um, there will never be enough money in the government to provide and do all the things that need to be done for conservation. And as a result of that, we also know that voluntary solutions really will be the best approach to take 
of all of these things. And ultimately, we want to see um, local farmers and landowners develop a plan that's based on the potential for improved environment. <clears throat> farmers then um, really have a great impact, as we've said before. And as we see what STAR is, am I controlling these slides? I can't see, oh, there it goes, thank you. Um, what is it? Very simply, very simply, it is a simple and free initiative by farmers for farmers. What we want to do then is look at three parts here that says it's all about local resource concerns. It is about the practices that are affecting those, pro those particular uh, resource concerns. And in our case in Illinois, it's about nutrient loss reduction and how we can look at the practices that affect those things. And thirdly, we want to look at the technical assistance that's needed. So as we look at, um, sorry, back up a little bit to what is STAR, the resources can be water quality, it can be water quantity, it can be forests and woodlands, or it can be even soil health. In the case of Illinois, as I said before, we look at an individual field, and what we want to talk about, of course, is what are the factors that affect the nutrient losses on those individual fields? And who would determine that? Well, we have a science advisory committee that makes those decisions as to what practices contribute to nutrient losses and which ones prevent nutrient losses. Then, of course, what we want to see is ultimately, as someone uses STAR, they become aware of what practices need to be changed. But they need some technical assistance. And that's why we are so centered on using the local conservation district to help identify what changes can be and should be made. So the staff in those local conservation districts are critical to having STAR ultimately do what it's supposed to do. So we're going to talk about three steps then. Uh, ultimately, we call evaluation, verification, and recognition. If we go to the slide that shows the form itself, that's where we start with an evaluation of, in our case, individual fields. So a farmer or a landowner has a field form that's completed. Frankly, it's important that it be kept simple. That's why typically a farmer can fill out that form for one field in about four minutes. The other part that I learned a long time ago working with farmers and agriculture is it has to be free, and it is. Yes, I know a lot of you like that, so. Um, but very simply, we think that those two pillars, as I like to call them, of our STAR program is that it's simple and it's free. But who determines what practices then really should be mentioned? As I said, it's a science committee. And very simply, that group of people determine how many points should be assigned for various practices and how many points would it take to become a STAR rating because STAR becomes a rating system of anywhere from one to five stars. Obviously, most of us would rather stay in a hotel that's five stars instead of one star, right? This is a pretty nice hotel. Um, very simply, we want to develop other kinds of evaluation tools because not all of you necessarily have row crops. So what's being hap what is happening right now by some states is they're developing evaluation forms that fit in with their local conservation resource concerns. We're very fortunate in our case to have a, a science advisory committee that's made up of some experts, uh, most of whom are pretty local, but from around the state of Illinois, we actually have input. And those experts also include some farmers, in particular several farmers who are actively working on developing conservation practices. The second area besides ev the evaluation itself is the verification. Early on in the history of STAR, we had interest by, and still do have interest by, various partners in the industry. And one of the things we learned right away is if we're gonna have something that they might be able to use, that it needs to be verified. And so we have a process that's developed whereby we have randomly select about 10% of all the fields that are evaluated in a given year, and those are then verified. The next slide has to do with recognition. 
We understand that there are some of you as farmers and landowners who want to be recognized for your conservation efforts. But it's been interesting for me to talk to some farmers or landowners who said, you know, I really don't do this for the recognition. I just do it because it's the right thing to do. That's a great attitude, isn't it? But from our perspective is, we think it's really important that more people know about STAR so they might be able to use this tool. And that's why we have a signage program. Free signs are given out to anyone who asks for them if they've had their fields evaluated. By the way, those signs have been provided for us by Farm Credit Illinois and Compere Financial have paid for those signs so far. But in addition to that, if you see on the lower left, there's a picture of some <laughs> frosted flake boxes. For a couple of years now, Kellogg has been supportive of STAR by helping provide some awards. So you actually see the photo on there. One guy in the lower left you might recognize. Tom's back here somewhere. Um, but outstanding farmer, outstanding partners, outstanding local district are been awarded each year. And we're pretty proud of that, that there's recognition going on. So the STAR structure itself is made up of a STAR steering committee that manages what is STAR and how we function from there. I'm not gonna read the names, but very simply, that group is made up of a wide range of conservation professionals that will help us identify what STAR needs to continue to be. Next slide is about, again, our structure that soon after STAR began in that spring of 2017, we started to have an interest by other conservation districts in Illinois that said we would like to use the STAR program. We see the advantages. So we developed a very simple license agreement, as we call it, so that they too can now uh, be involved. And we continue to see a lot of that, including four districts in Indiana are now a part of the program. But we also had, about a year and a half ago, several states contact us because they knew about STAR and they were very interested in perhaps becoming a part of it. So we now have three states that have signed a memorandum of understanding and that has made them state affiliates as we call it. Next slide is one that simply points out that there are many benefits or many groups in particular that are benefiting from STAR, whether it be farmers and ranchers or conservation professionals, et cetera, but ultimately, I believe the advantage is to the environment itself. Because a star is successful, it isn't about just getting a star rating. It's about making the changes that gives a better star rating because that also improves the environment around us. If you have any questions about the program itself, you're gonna hear a lot more in the next few minutes about star. I will be at our display table out in the foyer and be glad to talk to anyone about uh, more details. And I really appreciate your time here and I really appreciate this organization. NACD has been a great uh, supporter of STAR and uh, I don't take that lightly and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Bruce. That background was very helpful. As we go into the, the next program here, uh, we'll have a roundtable to discuss more about the STAR program. Next is Colorado State Conservation Board Program Manager, Cindy Lair. She'll discuss her state's involvement with the STAR program. Cindy? Well, good morning, everybody. Big Colorado hello in, uh, in Illinois. And I'm starting my timer to hold myself to it. But um, um, I'm real excited to talk about the STAR program to you. It was a year and a half ago in Las Vegas that I learned about STAR for the very first time. Little did I know that in a year and a half, we'd be getting back together finally again, and because we didn't know we were going to be apart so long, and that we would, um, that I would be talking to you about STAR, because I was dazzled. I, quite honestly, the presentation I heard at the Ecosystem Services Management uh, Consortium was, uh, it was Ecosystem Services Market Consortium was really an outstanding presentation by Bruce and Steve. And um, I said, wait a minute, 
we're trying to develop a soil health program in Colorado. They're doing this for water quality. We all know there's so much crossover for what you do. And um, there, you know, I, um, I wanted sincerely for conservation districts to deliver the soil health program in Colorado. That was my top priority. I had seen it done in other states nearby Colorado where it was kind of taken out of the hands of the conservation districts and, and other groups were out there saying this is what we needed to be doing. And I said, that's not how we want to be doing it in Colorado. So when I heard Steve and Bruce talk about the STAR program, I immediately thought this is made by conservation districts for conservation districts. It puts the districts in the driver's seat for a future program. And, and I think about all these things that are coming before us, uh, talking about natural climate solutions, talking about working on carbon sequestration and reducing greenhouse gases, and the work that they're doing on the STAR program in Illinois and Indiana and, and um, Iowa, um, are, that's all working towards carbon sequestration. What we're doing in Colorado for soil health is going to be working on carbon sequestration, but what I like is it puts the districts in the front driver's seat and it also is a tool that can be solidifying districts place in the future and so that's what um, attracted me to it and um, um, I think I um, can go forward yeah um, so um, the um, it's it's hard to know it's uh, hard to know what you're doing on this uh, um, on this um, monitor here. Sorry about that. So you know we're working on these soil health principles, and uh, they're all uh, not uncommon to you. You've been working with your producers for many years on that, and um, um, it took us. It didn't take us very long to decide to ourselves that. Um, um, having the conservation districts deliver this would be the way to do it. And, um, you know, um, w the hardest part for us after talking to Illinois um, STAR was how do we make STAR fit Colorado's cropping systems that really are very different from the um, Midwestern cropping systems. And that's what, if, if I had any kickback or pushback from anybody in Colorado, it was, we're not corn and soybeans here, okay? And I said, yes, that's true. So we worked very closely with Colorado State University. We have our own star science team in Colorado, and we have um, created eight different sheets or, or questionnaires. You saw Bruce's there earlier. And uh, we, we've created eight different ones, and that hasn't been an easy task to think about rangelands, um, uh, we have corn, we have uh, dry land and uh, irrigated ground and a lot of different scenarios, vineyards and orchards. So we really had to make it so that our forms were all adapted and uh, similar in their requirements. We didn't want to favor one type of cropping system over another as far as what they were doing to achieve their four stars or three stars or things like that. And, um, and the good news is um, we have had a team also working with us to start writing grants and the the beauty is our partners which uh you know we we wrote a 319 grant and and got it that uh, we can work with the conservation districts to work on water quality with soil health in colorado and it's going to be led by the conservation districts we also have written a uh, conservation partners uh, uh, program grant through the National Fish and Wildlife Federa uh, Foundation that we're excited. Uh, we haven't gotten news that we're going to get that, but hopefully in the next couple weeks we'll be hearing about it. We also uh, applied for a conservation innovation grant um, to, to try to uh, bring more dollars to the STAR program to make it um, so that all the conservation districts, all 75 conservation districts in Colorado who want to do it, can do it. Uh, that's the other thing I wanted to bring up. This is totally a voluntary program. We are not, at the state, forcing conservation districts to do anything. 
what looked so good about STAR to me was it is a mechanism. It's a delivery mechanism for a conservation district. They don't have to think all through how to make this work locally. That's uh, been done for you. And, and um, I'm just kind of saying that to our state partners. I'm a member of NASCA. And uh, those of you that are with NASCA, this is worthwhile to think about as you're trying to create more programs that your conservation districts can deliver easily to be local leaders in conservation. This is one of those that I think um, that's what was so attractive to me with star. Um, in our CS, it's really too bad they're not here today because I think they'd be very excited to hear what star can do uh, to help promote conservation planning. Um, my state conservationist, um, Clint Evans, has been with us um, on this STAR program from the time he heard about it for the first time. And he said, what can I do to help? And how can we help um, in our field offices uh, help the conservation districts deliver this? And so it's, it's been a really positive relationship. And, and they see the value of when the conservation districts are out there working on this questionnaire and, and deciding what's going to happen on that land, they realize that it's also a wonderful opportunity to get into conservation planning, uh, to get that conversation going about conservation planning. The other part about it is that producer might already be an equip, you know, uh, they might already be working on an equip contract. They might need to have additional funding to help flesh out uh, their uh, financial obligation for that equip contract. And some of the funding that we have um, available through the conservation districts that's coming from the state it's going to the conservation districts. They have the ability to help augment that producer's uh, financial obligation for the equip. So what I see about this is it goes hand in hand with federal programs. It's completely complementary. It's a collaborative process. And really, that's, that's what makes it a win-win for the districts and for the landowners. And so um, the other thing I wanted to mention about this was that um, we're also able to give $20,000 vouchers to the districts to make available to their, um, to their landowners. Um, we only have 25 of them. It's not like we're made of money or anything like that. But we have 25 vouchers that districts can apply to um, to make available to their landowners to help with equipment transition. Because if you're going to no-till or if you're, uh, if you're going to some of these different practices, sometimes the biggest limitation is uh, having the equipment to, to make that. So, you know, it, stripper cedar or stripper headers are really expensive. $20,000 won't buy one, but it does help. And so we're just trying to make some of the um, changes um, that need to take place as far as helping a producer be able to convert to some of the practices, uh, a better uh, soil situation. It could be cover crops, it could be um, no-till, it could be some type of conservation tillage program, but we're definitely understanding it's not a one-size-fits-all. So um, I, I want you to know that STAR is very versatile. So if we can do it in Colorado and compare it to what's going on in Illinois, um, it, yes, it is. It, I told you before, it takes a little bit of time to be able to um, um, adapt those forms. That's the biggest lift, I think, for any state or any, any um, local conservation districts that wants to do this. But it is possible, and I think working with your land-grant university to make that change and to, to help adapt it, Colorado State has been very excited about this program and excited to work with us on it. Um, it's, um, like I said before, it's a great opportunity for state agencies when you're trying to bring something that helps your conservation districts. Um, I think we're all working together to make sure that you guys are the leaders for tomorrow's conservation and regenerative ag and sustainable ag. It's, it's called all kinds of things, but we all know it's what you do. So um, it's, it's uh, that forward thinking vision, rather than looking just always in the back mirror saying, oh yeah, this is what we're made of, we came from the Dust Bowl. 
I'm thinking, what are we doing for the future for conservation districts? And this is where STAR has been the answer. Um, so I've already talked to you about um, how NRCS has been supportive of it, and I think nationally they're going to be quite supportive of it too. There's, there's nothing that I can see that is would stop um, the partnership from embracing something like this. I'm wanting to put out a, a challenge to a, a coastal state to try it. I'd love to see how you might be able to adapt some of the STAR principles to be able to work um, on uh, producers that are um, affecting coastal waters and that sort of thing. And uh, the cool thing, we've been working on this for, an, for a little over a year and um, we have different organizations that are coming to us and saying, hey, can we help work with conservation districts and help deliver this? And so the Colorado corn growers um, are, are one of the groups that are going to help um, deliver the STAR program. And also um, uh, the Audubon Conservation Ranch program has come to us recently. Now the cool thing is that um, I wanted to tell you about uh, the zero um, food print, and I'll, I have a picture of that coming up here, but at the, what we're really hoping for is that this becomes a market signal for um, commodity buyers like General Mills, Ardent Mills. We are wanting producers to be able to not just get incentive payments, um, although incentive payments are really good, but if they could get more money for their crop because they are um, accomplishing these different practices that help um, uh, provide ecosystem services, and it also helps the sustainability um, commitments that the, the um, grain buyers are um, committing to. If, we want to make sure that there is a way to layer these benefits on to the payments that the producers are getting for their crop. And so um, we, we think that, um, well, we're already in discussions with the, the buyers for this, and I think um, it's just a matter of time after we have um, implemented the STAR program, because we really haven't implemented it yet. We've had some wonderful districts that have worked with us to help pilot it, but um, we're, we're still at that point we're gonna be launching here really soon. Um, and then um, uh, I wanted to mention about uh, the zero food print, and uh, this was kind of cool. This just happened a couple of days ago where there's this zero food print organization and they're they're new and they're going into these big cities and metropolitan areas like Denver County and Boulder County and they're working with the um, higher level restaurants and they're asking them to charge a surcharge it's a 1% surcharge for um, a sustainability and climate um, um, payment and what they do is they collect all those dollars and they are putting them out to farmers and ranchers to implement these different practices and and they have the whole all the calculations made for these practices as to what the carbon um, um, reduction would be from um, this one percent on their food bill on their dinner bill and and how that's going to uh, help benefit farmers and they came to us and they said we would love to work with you to have the conservation districts um, deliver this money to landowners to support their conservation efforts. And, and all we ask of you is that we um, can measure that practice uh, in the Comet tool, and um, that is a wonderful tool to be able to um, measure the, the conservation benefits through the climate, or through the carbon reductions. And um, all we ask is that you give us that information so that we can um, um, verify and make sure that it is doing what we promise it's going to do. So these are new ways that are coming out, and that's what's kind of exciting, is finding new market opportunities where conservation is is really going to prevail and um, and I think conservation districts are going to prevail with this too so um, we've only just begun on this journey I really want to thank um, Steve Steerwalt and Bruce Henriksen and the rest of the team at the Champaign County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District they've been awesome to work with. They, uh, I feel like we've had every freedom in the world and uh, you know the only constraints on the star system that they've given me are things that I would want to support and, and constrain too so that we're all managing star in 
throughout the country in the same way and uh, not making it something that's an easy lift, but not making it too hard of a lift either. So um, they've given us all the guidance in the world and I'm very grateful for that. And um, I wanted to give you the, um, this is our soil health initiative address down here. And um, if I can answer any questions for you, I'd be very happy to. I think we'll have a, a bit of time with this panel. So thanks a lot. Cindy, thank you so much. That was uh, so exciting. Uh, and we look forward to this panel for sure. We're going to uh, talk more about the STAR program, but we want to bring Steve back to the stage because he has some special presentations to make for the 2020 STAR Awards. Steve? Well, thank you. Thank you, Rita, and, and thank you, Cindy. Uh, one of the benefits that, that I never never saw coming to getting involved with this is getting a chance to work with people like Cindy and and Dennis over here with what they're doing in Iowa and, and Missouri uh, what 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 uh, what we you know tried to start in Illinois has become so much more than what we could do in Illinois uh, the as a tent gets bigger what we find is we learn more from the people who are finding ways to implement it than, than, than we ever we ever thought was possible. It's, it's that collaborative approach that uh, is, is really been fun. So uh, we, do, we do have uh, some star awards we'd like to like to give out right now uh, to, to celebrate the success and keep the mo movement building. We're excited to recognize some winners of the star since 19. Uh, since 2019, Kellogg Company has sponsored these awards along with the STAR in, in, <coughs> initiative more broadly. Although travel restrictions have kept Mary Gallagher, Kellogg Senior Manager of North American Res Responsible Sourcing, she sent a video clip, so we'd like to share that with you. From all of us here at Kellogg, we want to congratulate all of the STAR 2020 awardees. Kellogg is proud to be presenting these awards today and proud to be supporting the STAR initiative. As part of Kellogg's Better Days commitment to support 1 million farmers and workers by 2030, we've been collaborating with the Nature Conservancy to expand the Saving Tomorrow's Agriculture Resources Initiative in Illinois. The STAR initiative was created by farmers for farmers, and it's one way that we can support local grassroots initiatives that spur conservation and support the farmers who grow the critical ingredients for our products like corn for cornflakes and frosted flakes. Thank you and congratulations again to the STAR awardees. Okay, it's too bad Mary couldn't be here. She's, she's a really interesting gal and, and been very supportive of, of finding ways to get conservation done. So we have three awards to present this morning. Our first award is the 2020 Star Partner of the Year Award, and that goes to someone who continues to champion its use amongst industry partners and beyond. We're recognizing uh, Sarah Blount, uh, the Midwest Conservation Technician from American Farmland Trust as the Partner of the Year. Uh, she, she, in cooperation with the McCoupin County Soil and Water Conservation District, Sarah has taken the initiative to raise awareness of STAR in areas. Uh, she, she has developed billboards, postcards, and more to get the word out. Uh, Sarah, we think, as, as, uh, as you, anybody who grew up with cornflakes, uh, the uh, Kellogg's uh, and, and cornflakes, Sarah, we think you're great. So. We, we appreciate what, what Sarah, Sarah's done, and, and I think, I, I don't know if it has a picture of her, her cereal box, but uh, it's, it's a small thing, but uh, they put the, these award winners' pictures right on a cereal box. They don't go into the stores, you know, or anything like that, but, but it's a nice little keepsake. Oh, there's one right there. Okay, not Sarah's, but... Just as an example, the award winners get their own their, get their own cereal box with their with their picture on it. So, yeah, like I say, it's it's not it's not not a huge thing. But uh, the the first one we gave out uh, these uh, went to Jeff O'Connor, and he said that that Tony the Tiger was his 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 hero when he was growing up. So he was he was so pleased with that. 
So uh, we really appreciate what, what Sarah's done. Our, our, our next, uh, we have the 2020 Farmer of the Year. Uh, as, as we know, we, we've talked about how do, we, how do we get conservation out on the ground. Uh, those of us that, you know, in districts and like, like that, we know how powerful it is when farmers can in, uh, influence farmers. And so one, one of the reasons that, that we try to recognize the farmer of the year is that when, when we find people that are, are, are not just doing it themselves, but they, but they you know, we'll, we'll talk about why conservation is important. And so this year, uh, this year it goes to the family, not only utilizes the program themselves, but went above and beyond to influence other growers to participate. Uh, taking questions, setting up meetings, and again, being an advocate for the program. This shows a commitment of our farmers to finding practical, feasible solutions to their local resource concerns. So the Martin family farm uh, from Logan County, Illinois, as a 2020 Star Farmers of the Year. Derek, with his younger brother Doug, and Father Jeff have long been leaders in the use of conservation practices. Martin has submitted fields uh, in first year in 13 fields, 30 fields the next year, and 50 fields the next year. And they've also been influential in getting neighbors involved. So uh, they were able, unable to join us today, but uh, we want to congratulate the Martin family. And they are great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And finally, we have the star licensee of the year. Uh, licensees are local districts. Uh, as, as Cindy so put it so well, you know, we're, we don't, don't try to, uh, you know, uh, say districts, you have to do this or anything like that. That's not the idea. It's, it's, it's districts or a local unit in Illinois or local units of government that make their own. So, so, uh, all they, when they sign up to handle the program, uh, that they, they become a licensee. So local licensees administer the star within their own county. They promote the initiative locally, score and review field forms, and offer technical assistance to farmers wanting to increase their star ratings. So local licensees are the lifeblood and the face of the program across the state. We wouldn't have capacity to offer the program without their local enthusiasm and support. <clears throat> so we do have the local licensees of the year Oh, here, so you guys come on up. Uh, the 2020 Star Licensee of the Year goes to uh, Illinois County, the highest increase in participation, DeKalb County Soil and Water Conservation District, represented by Jeff Woodett and Dean Johnson. We think you're? Great. <laughs> okay. okay, Jeff. <laughs> All right, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the SCAR committee for recognizing our, our work with the program as well as Kellogg for uh, putting us on a cereal box. My dad said, hey, well, it beats being on the side of a milk carton. So, uh, so we'll definitely have this up, on, up in the office for a while. But um, the first week I was on the job, we had to go to a meeting, and it was a STAR meeting, so it was back in um, 2017. So Dean, Dean Johnson, the executive director, says, hey, you might want to pay attention. This is going to be important. Um, so three years later, and this being our fourth sign-up, um, it, it's going great. It's a wonderful way to engage farmers. They, they fill out this form, they get a rating, and then we, we get their ear to talk about conservation, um, talk about water quality, talk about nutrient management. It really is a simple way um, to, to get them engaged. And for the district, uh, it gets us out there. Um, people in the community see those signs, they call us up, they ask us what it's all about. It's just one more way that we can get out and, and make an impact, so, Dean? Well, again, thank you for the recognition. Uh, my granddaughter's gonna love this. Uh, Grandpa did something good, uh, but uh, I've been with the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, 20 years, and uh, this is probably one of the first times in that 20 year where we've really seen a proactive program come along where we are actually sitting down and working with, with our farmers and have a, a structured type of a program that we can talk about with them that uh, will help direct them to making good decisions. So 
I think the STAR program is, is something that, uh, that's going to be around for a while. I, I think that uh, Champaign County in our state, I think they're very forward thinking and, and starting this program and I encourage uh, others to try it. I think it's something that's going to be uh, very beneficial to agriculture as we try to stay ahead of the re regulations that may be coming our way and uh, it's better for a farmer to to do it on his own than to have someone as was mentioned before with the big club uh, doing it for them so thank you very much Exciting. Congratulations again. Uh, well deserved for sure. Now we're going to ask our panelists to come and join us uh, on stage. Ryan Britt, Steve Searwalt, who is here, Dennis Carney, and Cindy Lair. Are they okay to all share? Okay. I learned something new out in the lobby this morning. You know, never underestimate the power of fresh breath. So hopefully <laughs> they're all dealing with that this morning. Okay, so we're talking about the STAR program. Each of you, if you would, um, I know we just heard from Cindy, but still uh, talk a little bit about your association and how you got involved with STAR, right? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Britt. I am uh, the past president of the Missouri Association and the NACD board member from Missouri. Uh, the STAR program, and I am a farmer in north central Missouri. My family raises corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, cattle background, um, cow calf background, and finished beef. So the STAR program, I guess, was first introduced to us by Steve when we were up in Racine, Wisconsin at the north central region. Uh, NACD meeting and Ron and I were up there at that time and I'll, I'll say some more about Ron here in a moment but uh, and and we just thought man that that just makes a lot of sense and so we started talking about it a little bit and as time went on we decided it was something we needed to do in Missouri and at the following year I guess we um, we got everything around to signing an MOU with Illinois and we were able to get started with the program, but then, you know, timing always uh, has a way of, of uh, taking care of things. And in Missouri, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we are called the show me state. And so we're not real fast at doing anything, I think. But um, so we're not where we wanna be yet. And um, COVID played a role in that, but, but uh, how, do you want me to go further into where we're at today? Sure. Sure, okay. So today, um, we still are, are taking in information and trying to figure out how to make STAR work best for us. Uh, Missouri is diverse, just like most states, but uh, even more so some than some with our cotton and rice and, and with a, a huge um, woodland area. And then, of course, corn, soybeans and, and a large portion of the state in grazing. And, and I appreciate what Cindy said and what she, they have done in Colorado and trying to figure out how to make that work for most cooperators. And so that's a huge challenge for us we're, we're working on. Uh, we've had a little bit of staffing issues that uh, we get to deal with that, like all of you do. And, um, and then we actually have rolled out a new program called 4R, which many states already had, and implemented that into our soil and water program, which obviously has some semblance 
And so uh, we didn't feel like it was good to try to roll out two programs at once during COVID when nobody was in the office and when we couldn't even sit down with NRCS. So uh, we are still not where we want to be. We're going to work through that and hopefully start to get some things moving forward. And, and as I mentioned, Ron Willis is our, our new state president. And, and so I think he's going to do a great job of, of picking up that torch and carrying it on. And we'll get it across the finish line. We're just not on the pace that we wanted to be at. Cindy, do you have anything to add um, post-presentation? I think I kind of uh, said most of what I needed to say, but I'm excited for our collaboration with the Colorado Association of Conservation Districts and how we will be able to work together to be uh, making this available to conservation districts that want to participate. Right now, um, they're all interested in knowing what's going to happen or how they can get involved. We're about ready to open our application process um, on August 1st. We were lucky enough to get stimulus money from our legislature. And uh, interestingly enough, our legislature actually knows about the STAR program and they wanted to make sure that it could be supported um, through this stimulus money for soil health. So um, STAR is a household name almost in, in, um, in our agriculture and in, in Colorado government. Um, they're, they're really interested in, in finding ways to make it, um, make it useful to um, deliver conservation programming locally. So um, it's preliminarily a success, but the, the proof will be in the implementation, of course, but, and hearing back from the conservation districts to hear what they think about how, how it is for them. Mm, awesome. Go ahead with Dennis. Good morning. Um, Iowa apparently looks a lot like Illinois, so we didn't have to change our field forms very much. I heard Steve talk a couple different times at the same meetings that the rest of you did, and uh, got pretty excited about the idea. I thought STAR just sounded like a wonderful thing for a whole lot of reasons that we'll probably hit later, but we jumped on board and signed a, the first cooperating state agreement here a couple of years ago. I was able to go with Steve uh, right away to, uh, to meet with Corteva when we had a, our state meeting in Des Moines and their headquarters is in West Des Moines. So we sat down with them and it was kind of exciting to hear the, the brass of industry get kind of excited about it. And, and we sat there and we're just the program was new and we didn't know what we were doing and they asked us how soon can we get this uh, nationwide. Wow. We kind of looked at each other and said, maybe we're in the wrong meeting. And I was trying to get it countywide about that point. Um, but anyway, we got excited in Iowa about it. We talked, we uh, investigated a lot. We did get some funding, funding lined up and were able to pay for half of a staff person set up uh, for this past crop year, the 2021 crop year, because our year starts uh, after harvest is when the field form rotates. So. Uh, we were able to get some funding, offered some incentive money to uh, 25 counties in the southeast part of Iowa. That's, uh, we, got a we have 100 districts, so we picked a quarter of them. It's a hard sell during a pandemic, uh, even though we, our little faces appeared at their meetings on the, on the screen. It's not like shaking hands and, and talking to them in person. But we got about 10,000 acres enrolled, 150 some uh, fields. And some counties, you know, they couldn't, you know, we couldn't talk them into it. Other ones jumped all over it. So it's, we're, we're rolling. We're going to put it in another 25 counties this next year and uh, hope for great things. Awesome. And Steve, with the Kellogg's box in front of you, can you talk more about the partnerships with Kellogg's and TNC in promoting STAR? Uh, yeah, the, uh, as I say, the, the interest, thank you, Dennis. I can't do, walk at you now, I'm so so uh, the, the interesting thing, well, one of the interesting things we found is, um, as, as we've noticed and, and, and Dennis pointed out when we were talking to Corteva, uh, industry is trying to figure this out. Uh, how do they best fit into, uh, you know, they have corporate responsibilities that they're interested in and, and they're trying to figure it out. There, there's, it's, it's uh, you know, the wild west out there right now with, with uh, carbon and uh, soil health and all the different things that different, different industry groups are trying to deal with. Uh, so Kellogg's, Kellogg's interest is because of you folks. Uh, they think locally led is the way to go. 
they, they, they like the idea of, of uh, local people making those local decisions. And so their, their, their interest and in, in investment in, in the STAR program is, is with, the, with, the, with TNC, the Nature Conservancy, is actually uh, to, to try to help develop uh, the program. And uh, uh, they're, they're working on uh, what's, what's called a pay for performance model, quite frankly, that could be uh, that, that hopefully will be uh, in the future available to, to other industries as, as a model that, that they can, instead of everybody trying to, you know, figure it out on their own, here, here, is, here is how you can do it to actually get uh, money to farmers and money to districts to help run the programs. So I, I wish I, I could say, just like Dennis, that uh, all, all the things were figured out and, and we, all, we all know what's best, but, but we certainly don't. Um, that, that's, as, as I say, just, just getting to work with these people, um, uh, you know, we've learned so much and, and, and it makes the program better and uh, we're in the process now of, of, a, uh, of a ro rolling out a, uh, a national initiative. Uh, we've gotten, gotten funding to actually develop a not-for-profit and as we get that rolled out then we're, we'll be looking at how working with these folks and others interested in how best to to build a program to where we get input from all the different areas you know when it comes to to making star go in the future so it's it, it's 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 exciting uh and but uh don't pretend we have everything figured out so you've all referenced it just a bit but what has the reception been from the districts uh talk to that if you haven't already and then how do you plan to continue that communication and talk to the districts about the program. Of course. So um, the districts have, have had an introduction in that as we were going around our area meetings and, and our training conference before COVID, uh, we gave them the, the little glimpse that, hey, this is something that we want to do. And many were interested. Um, as you know, Missouri's got uh, a, a lot of dollars going through the districts through our state tax, and so many of them thought that they were overwhelmed already and they really didn't want another workload. So that's a challenge in itself, is figuring out how to balance the good work that's already being done and give this program the opportunity so that, you know, as somebody that gets to go in front of the legislature and, and, and whether it's at the federal level or you know in Missouri with our tax we have to get our money uh, approved even though it's a sales tax we still has to be um, approved by our legislature we need to be showing them what we're doing for our work in this program what the beauty of it was is you're gonna bring dollars in from industry to continue the work that's already being done so the districts like that until they realize that, hey, um, there may not be any more money coming in for them to do more work and then they're not as excited. So, so that's, you know, the challenges that we have to work through. And, and as we're moving forward with climate talks and, and maybe we'll talk about the climate task force here in a moment. But, you know, I think there's going to be opportunities in the future to figure out how to make the whole system work well together. Thanks. Well, um, Colorado is uh, less fortunate because it is a, we don't have a lot of money to give to the districts. Our districts are poorly funded. So we couldn't just come out and say, hey, conservation districts, guess what you get to do? This is a wonderful program for you. We really had to find ways to uh, put some dollars behind it. And um, we were excited because we see there are a lot of conservation districts that don't have full-time district managers and full-time staff. And so we thought if we could bring some money in this and and bring training to the districts um, for those district managers there are a lot of district managers that are excited about soil health they want to help um, and and so if they could have a little bit of training and funding to help flesh out their funding for their jobs we we see it being a win-win in a lot of different ways but as far as their reception to us um, and to the star program i should say um, we went to them we went to about five conservation districts for a pre-pilot to say 
would you look at our forms? Would you go through it with a landowner and see where the bugs are, see where it's clunky, and, and tell us what you see as the problem? Because um, we're not pretending to know what we're doing here. We're just starting out ourselves. And so we, we made it in such a way that it was a, we're doing this together and thank you for helping us. And, um, and so they've been good about saying, wow, <laughs> you need to really work on this part of it and, and things like that. So we, we're grateful to those few districts that have helped us along the way, but we're really excited to make it be something that builds capacity for Colorado's conservation districts because we are lacking in that area. So it's a, it's a resource oriented tool to address their um, resource concerns, but it also hopefully will build that capacity that's needed. Just curious, how many districts do you have in Colorado? In Colorado, we have 75 conservation 75. districts. Yeah. Compared, Steve, to Illinois? Uh, 96, and, and, and we have, we have uh, I think, 73, 76 districts uh, that, that uh, have signed up for the program. And what about the reception from, from the districts uh, for the program here? Well, I, I think uh, obviously Dean and DeKalb County were, were a very, uh, very good spokesman for, for, for the districts there. Uh, they, they have a very uh, active county and, and are doing great work. And uh, just like uh, Cindy has talked about, there's some districts have more resources and, and, and than others. And, and so the, it's, it, it is just, we, we all know in conservation, there's, we're all doing uh, more than we get paid for. And so it, it is tough to have enough time because it, to, to take on something, you have to maybe give something up. So uh, it's, it's not easy for districts to, to, to you know, pick up another program, but um, um, the districts that, that uh, some districts have, have really embraced it and the, uh, the Department of Ag in Illinois uh, has, um, has, has basically they, they have a, a a funding program also cost share program and and the department of ags on board to where the, anybody who takes uh their the cost share program is also going to fill out a field a star form uh, what, what they like about it is it's a way to you know with the with the rating system it's a way for them to show progress you know with their with their so so, so often it's hard for a uh, state government or anybody to to take cost your money and then be able to show that you're making a difference where with with the star program they can track individual fields and actually say okay yes yes we are making improvements or we're not and so it, the gov state government likes it because it's a way of, of actually you know being able to prove to legislators that that we are making progress Dennis what was the question no I just <laughs> um, <laughs> We didn't use this as an individual district sign up. This was a state with the state association signed the agreement. We're the ones trying to get the districts to sign up, establish this pilot area, offered incentives. We paid them a hundred bucks a farm if they'd sign up, not a farm, a hundred dollars a field if they'd sign it up. Kind of a waste of money, honestly. I don't think it inspired anybody to go out and the commissioners to get up off their chairs and go out and recruit fields. So I don't know if that's the best use of our money. I think that money would have been better spent in advertising and creating demand on the other end. I think we need to talk to the landowners and the renters and the people involved in who farms what land and, and steer them toward people that are using the proper practices measured by the STAR program. So I think that's the way we want to go. We, we had an agreement or had a phone call just last week where we've got uh, the Iowa Soybean Association is real interested in it, and they're going to hire two, it's statewide, so it's not a lot, but two people that will be conservation consultants, not crop consultants. And they will carry the, their field, the star field form in their file. And when they have, they could call to a farmer, they can, well, here's an option. So, so we're excited about that. Awesome. Back to uh, Ryan and to Cindy. You both worked on the what you mentioned, NACD's Climate Action Task Force. Can you guys talk about that and how it could potentially crisscross with the STAR program? Well, I'll start and then Cindy can make everything better <laughs> after I get done here. So um, I, I do think that uh, the Climate Action Task Force is exciting and that, you know, obviously that's a buzzword in, in D.C. right now. It's a priority of the administration and it has 
you know, a potential for uh, the lot of the work that's being done through STAR aligns very well with the principles in whatever can be done on the farm for climate action. I think that, that there's, the task force itself was tasked with uh, doing work to immediately make a public comment that, to be submitted for uh, the administration. And then, you know, I think, and don't let me speak for Tim here, but I, I think we, we looked at what was going to be our short term, short term work and then our long term work and then the short term things that can be done in agriculture and then the long term things that can be done in agriculture. And I think STAR is a great example of, of how a program could be implemented nationally and worked in whether it's with the carbon trading. I don't know about everyone else here as, as producers, but last winter I had five different companies come to our farm and, and try to buy carbon credits. You know, not very many of them had any cash that they were throwing at me. And every one of them had different rules and every one of them were measuring carbon differently. And my biggest concern is, like many people in this room, I, we've been doing no-till for a long time. We've been doing cover crops for a long time. A lot of those carbon programs that were paying for carbon credits, to get them the largest payment from them, you had to be a conventional till operation that was going to switch to no-till or going to add cover crops. Or, you know, you're only going to get paid for the improvements that you made. Well, that's pretty tough for somebody that's already been doing it for a long time. So those are the type of things that we've discussed in the task force. And as we move forward, you know, the type of recommendations that we're going to try to keep pushing. Well, you kind of said it all there, and, and that's perfect. But I, what I would add is that um, I think what STAR lends to the climate work is that um, you will get information from the field that you can input into the Comet tool. Hopefully you know what the Comet tool is. There's Comet Farm and there's Comet Planner. And they're both produced by NRCS as well as Colorado State University. Go Rams, and then, um, but it's a great tool to measure the impact, the carbon impact, and um, I think STAR goes hand in hand with some of these tools to, to measure what's possible as far as uh, the type of carbon credits you could get. I haven't met any farmers that have are being um, barraged by people wanting to buy their carbon, but that's a really cool thing. I think the market opportunities that are there are really really outstanding and I'll just leave it at that for now. Tremendous opportunity for sure and Dennis you and I talked about this topic yesterday and I think this has so much potential when you talk about farm succession, finding the right person to, to farm your ground, it's so important. So non-operating landowners often have barriers to getting conservation on their field. So can you talk about that and how STAR brings that discussion to kind of a whole nother level? It was kind of an epiphany moment for me, and I think all of us that are state leaders, we get, uh, we get grabbed after meetings and, and we're perceived as experts, whether we are or not. But I was at a meeting uh, about three years ago, and uh, happened somehow during the course of the presentation, I mentioned I was from Floyd County, north central part of the state. After the meeting, a woman came up to me and said, wow, Floyd County, I just got, I just took control of 500 acres of my family's farmland. My brother always did it, he passed away. I'm an absentee landowner, I don't know anything about it. I really want it to be done uh, conservation-minded. Give me a list of the farmers that I should rent it to. And I stood there and said, yeah, I don't have that. You know, I, I said, geez, I wish I had that. You know, how, how can I tell her who to contact? Ta-da. So when I heard about STAR, I went, you know, the old light, it's a little, I'm a little slow sometimes, but the light bulb went off. And I said, boy, here's a system. You know, look for a farmer that has a field that's a three stars or four stars. You don't have to write a complicated conservation lease that's four pages long. You just write in the back, it said, this farm will participate in STAR and it will carry a four star rating. End of story. You don't have to know anything about nutrients. You don't have to know fertilizer, timing. You don't even have to be around. So I just think that's a wonderful opportunity, both for the landowner that wants crops grown right, and for a tenant who is doing things right, he can kind of wave his little flag over here, look, uh, I'm doing things good, you, maybe you could rent to me. 
So I just think that's a that's a big part of Star. I know I'm, I'm looking forward to when Star has market incentives and we get paid for doing everything right. But for right now, the land and Steve was the one that put me onto this, but land access and the ability of these, you know, half the land in Iowa, I may mean, actually I think it's sixty percent, is rented to somebody else that doesn't own it. So there's a big market out there. If you want to do it right, so we need to advertise to those people and tell them to use the STAR program as a verification tool to make sure that it's done right. That's awesome. And Steve, while uh, the, the mic is open there near you, is there anything we haven't covered as far as the, you know, the attributes of STAR, why it's unique, why it's different? <laughs> um. As, as, as we talked about when we the, when at the beginning of star one, one of the things that um, that was very important was uh, the 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 bottom up approach uh, the, the, the and, and we shouldn't call it the bottom up approach it should be called those of us who are on the land that know what's best for our land ha are, are, are empowered find a way to be empowered to, to, to come up with those local solutions for the local problems. Uh, the, you know, there's, there's wonderful programs out there that, that, that start at the national level and it flows down, and, and there's, there's very good reasons for that because it's, it's very difficult to, to, to build something that goes the other way. But um, one of the things that, uh, that we're, we're trying to do, hoping to do with the STAR program is empower districts just like yourselves out there a as a way of 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 being those you know uh, being those local experts uh, and and working with your farmers on what's best in, in your area you know with your resource concerns and then having a way of measuring that at both measuring the outcomes both at a state level and and we hope a national level uh, a couple uh, a year or so ago, the uh, uh, NACD, uh, 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 the, the delegates, this delegate body, uh, s agreed to support STAR with education and promotion. And, and that's, that's been, a, been a wonderful thing. Uh, Sarah, Sarah's great. She, she, she really gets out there. So, so I really appreciate the participation of, of NACD and, and uh, you know, just, we'll just see how things develop in the future, but I, I hope that, that there's, there's ways that we can, we can continue to work together and work closer in the future because I think NACD is, is, is a great organization to, to handle things nationwide, and, uh, and we'll just see how things develop. Cindy, when you um, gave your presentation, you talked about um, your thought about getting this program to the coast, east and west. Why and maybe what are your thoughts about the potential there? Well, being a landlocked state like Colorado, I am always amazed at the different problems the coastal states face. And as we're working more on climate solutions and, and uh, dealing with climate challenges, and rising sea levels and things like that, I just see more and more pressures on producers, on agriculture in those states. And, and agriculture is very important in those coastal states. And so I guess I'm, I throw it out as a challenge to them to, to think about it and say, maybe it would work for us. And you know, in Colorado, we're so different than the Midwest in, and water is our, you know, we're so water short and uh, they're, they're on the opposite end of the spectrum in a lot of ways in, um, in the coastal states. So I just was thinking it would just be a great challenge to see what it would do for them. And I think it could do a lot. Um, I think there's national applicability to STAR and I guess that's what, what made me so excited to be on this panel today was to, to talk about that potential. One thing I, I'm just going to throw in here uh, for my own question, and that is livestock. You know, all of your states have something in common, livestock production. Do you see this program down the road or maybe in the near future helping livestock farmers, you know, better address um, kind of the fight that they're doing, you know, give, giving them some, some rating and, and some rank? <laughs> Any one of you at that point, all of you, if, if you want to comment. Um, 
livestock is, you know, obviously we're, we're in, the, in our part of the world, we, we produce the feed, shall we say. And uh, as, as, we're, as we're looking at climate solutions and, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, and, and even the livestock industry, I think, is looking at ways to be able to say, we are, we are producing our livestock in, in the best, uh, uh, most uh, climate-friendly way possible. So I, I would hope that there might be a way for those of us who produce, that help produce feed, uh, you know, corn, soybeans that go into cattle rations, soybean, uh, hog rations, things like that. If, if, we, can, if we could work together on, on ways that, that we can uh, show uh, that, that, the, that your, some of the inputs, uh, the, the environmental benefits that, that are coming from uh, the inputs being raised, you know, in an in a, in a environmentally friendly way, that that could benefit the livestock producer then as they as they are talking to their to their consumers here's a way that you can that you can uh, help to market your product because you know your your grassland was was uh, here's here you know star could potentially be a way of uh, of, of measuring uh, your environmental uh, outcomes on your rangeland that then is used to to to, to feed your livestock and, and then be able to take credit that for, hopefully in the marketplace. I don't pretend to be an expert on those, but uh, uh, you know, a, a, a pie in the sky vision would be to take something and whether it's star or something else, if there's a better mousetrap and, and actually uh, everything that you do would give you points towards your, your um, uh, towards the consumer, whether that consumer is, is a fuel uh, fuel industry, where it's biodiesel or, or ethanol, or whether it's going into livestock, or uh, uh, this uh, just this Jeff O'Connor that I talked about the, the, with the Tony the Tiger, uh, he he had some uh, Taiwanese uh, that were visiting his farm, and uh, their tofu, their, that's their interest and things like that, and it was a soybean association that was sponsoring that, but. Uh, uh, the, the leader of that group from Taiwan went and grabbed the star sign and wanted to know about it because in their, in their, you know, as they're importing, as they're importing feeds and stuff like that, they want to be able to tell the story to their consumer that they're, that they're, uh, uh, what they're selling has, has been in, in, uh, produced in an environmentally way environmental way and so again I don't pretend to have it all worked out but she went and grabbed that when they were going to take a a picture of the whole group that was what she went and grabbed and, and, and brought it back so even internationally people are wanting a way to show that what they are purchasing uh, that they are making helping to make a difference and again I, I don't know that star is the best way to do that but we're offering that as as, as something to try to go down that road Ryan. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure how many of you have been to Missouri, but uh, Missouri is pretty diverse. Uh, the north half of the state and the Boot Hill, so the southeast part of the state, have a lot of row crops. And, and in soil and water world, we spend a lot of money on terraces or, or whether it's irrigation or whether it's, you know, programs that take a lot of money per acre. And the middle to southwest part of our state has a lot of grass. And those guys get really frustrated that all of these tax dollars are going to all these row crop guys that are, that are you know, getting money for doing a bad job of what they were doing. So this is actually, I think, a really good program and an opportunity to help diversify some of that money. And whether it's, it's working through the carbon programs to give those grazing guys credit for what they are actually doing, you know, using the districts to help certify what they're doing, or maybe it's you know helping those those guys um, implement some different covers into their grazing, and so that adds another layer. So then they get some carbon credit or so forth. But you know we're always trying to figure out how to balance things out because we are so diverse. And I think this is an opportunity to do that. It's just it's a little bit difficult to to kind of get that wrapped around in your mind and how you make those payments fair and how you. Uh, uh, you know, first you have to have dollars to work with, and so, you know, which comes first, <laughs> the chicken or the egg? And so those are the type of things that we're working on. We're just not there yet. We're going to keep working on it, and, and with Ron's guidance, I know we're going to get there. So. Hmm. so final question for the group. Uh, everyone gets a, a chance, if we haven't covered it yet, and the potential 
for STAR on the national level? You know, where you see NACD fitting in, uh, partnerships, potential, et cetera. You want to start there, Dennis, on the end? I think there's great potential. You know, again, it's early stages. Iowa had two field forms, corn and soy, you know, one field form, corn and soybeans, but we've got some diversity in Iowa. In fact, I think I even saw a cow once. But <laughs> down in the southern part of the state, we've got hills, and we've got, and we have to write a field form for them, like Cindy's doing. We have to write a field form for the so terraces down in, in southeast, southwest Iowa. So it's pretty, it's diverse in its own way, and uh, we need to come up with those field forms to match everybody. But I think, uh, talking national level, I, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but the last couple of days we've talked about 30 by 30 to no end, and, and really all I've heard is a lot of hand-wringing and, and wailing about how we're going to prove that, oh no, this is terrible. Jeez, we're a conservation organization, we have conservation in our name, we had a presidential order that mandated we should have 30 acres conserved, 30 percent conserved in 30 years. Why the hell not 50 percent in 30 years? Shouldn't we be a little more positive about this rather than worrying about how we're going to make 30 percent? So you're looking for a way to verify working lands production. Is it conserved? We got star. I mean, we, maybe it's not the right answer, but it's a, it's one on that road. So that's awesome. Steve. <laughs> well, uh, it was an eye opener as Dennis uh, um, talked about uh, when we met with the Corteva people at their world headquarters. Uh, we were thinking small potatoes, you know, uh, but what what became what became so clear, at least to us, when, after that meeting is. These, uh, these national, multi multinational uh, organizations want to work with something that's available uh, nationwide, if not worldwide. Uh, because a, a later call with Corteva, you know, they said, uh, you know, would this have applicab applicability, you know, in other countries? And, and so, you know, every time you think you have an answer for them, they come back with another one. <laughs> Uh, so, so we're we're needing, you know, in the long run, we're needing a, a a system that we can use all across the country. And again, I I don't want to predispose that stars the best mousetrap. Uh, there's always better things that come along and and the like like that. And and I'm, we're very open. If there's a better mousetrap comes along, we need to do what we need it for to 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 do the best job we can for for agriculture and conservation. But um, it is it it was it was an eye opener to to visit with some of these c companies. And if we can if we can provide them a way of meeting their needs on their national level or even international level uh, they are look they have money to spend they they want to be able to show their consumers that they're a good corporate citizen and so uh, don't know if we can get there but uh, it's it's tantalizing uh, to to look at a, a way to make a real difference in conservation Cindy well, I've already spoken about how I think it has national applicability, but I think as far as what NACD could do with STAR is, is helping the conversation go in a way that helps producers be there to get their share of the increase in payment you know, for that crop because um, there's a lot of fear um, out there, and I think rightfully so that the big... Uh, the big businesses will take the money and just dictate to producers what happens. And I think that's where conservation districts are the leaders. They don't want that to happen. Uh, they're, they're here to speak for the landowners and the ag producers. And if we can collectively make sure that the, the extra uh, market incentives that come which should come, and I think will come soon, um, that the farmer is getting those and, and sees the long-term um, um, profit in, in doing farming this way, so. Hmm. And Ryan. 
Well, it's always fun to be last to talk when, when we're trying to sum something like this up where you've had some of the best experts in the country already talking about it. And, and Cindy did take a lot of the words that I, I was thinking of right off the plate. You know, the, the people in this room are the exception to the rule because you are the ones that recognize the fact that we have to get out and we have to toot our own horn um, because nobody else is going to and nobody's going to do it accurately if you do have somebody else do it. I think the conservation districts have the perfect role in that the fact that the average farmer in our counties do trust the conservation districts. You know, as a general rule, there's a relationship already there. The problem with letting each one of the uh, different carbon companies or whatever the particular issue is do it on a commercial level is that they don't have that relationship that the conservation districts have and they don't have the uh, rules to go by that the conservation districts do and making sure that we are fair and that we're consistent. And I, I think that that gives those districts the, the perfect opportunity to represent the farmer. The farmer can get that advertising done for them. They can have that relationship to go talk to those companies and say that, you know, certify that what we've done is, is right and the way it should be done. And whether we're talking climate or whether we're talking carbon or so forth, it, that is the, the great, the, the best tool to get us there. And so I think we're in the, the right role. We're, we're headed down the right path and we're just going to have to work until we get there. Let's give them a round of applause. What a great panel. And we sure hope that this conversation for change continues uh, among the entire group here today. And we're going to take a break. And we'll be back here, if you wouldn't mind, be back here by 10.50 so we can start uh, the next portion of our program, the Conservation Forum. Thank you. Welcome, and we're going to get started with our next event. As uh, folks make their way back to their seats, we really appreciate uh, your attention, as it will be worth it for sure. Welcoming back to the stage seven members of the National Conservation Foundation's Next Generation Leadership Institute, and here to uh, introduce our lovely guest today, Brent Van Dyke. Brent? Thank you, and on behalf of the Next Generation Leadership Institute, uh, who is sponsored by the National Conservation Foundation, um, it's absolutely a, an honor and pr privilege for me to stand before you today. And for those that don't know, um, the Next uh, Generation Leadership Institute, as well as Envirothon, um, are sponsored by your foundation, and it is your foundation. After I left uh, the past president position for NACD, I, I went over to the foundation. I was uh, welcomed as a member of the foundation. And then in January, had the opportunity to move into the chair position. And that being said, when I first got involved in the foundation, the chair of the foundation, Steve Robinson, um, let us know he had a vision. And the foundation's been active for numerous years, for generations. But Steve let the uh, executive board and the trustees know that his mi vision of the foundation was to move it to the next step. And if, if you'll find this uh, annual plan that's out on the table out there, you'll see what our mission is. And it's to support NACD. We want eventually to be the, the fundraising arm of NACD, along with sponsoring programs like Envirothon, Next Generation of, of Leadership Institute. And so just to recognize the individuals that uh, almost every other week on Thursday morning at 6.30 Mountain Time, we have uh, the Conservation Foundation, but I'd like those members of the trustees and of the executive board from the foundation to just be stand, to please stand so we can recognize you. So. so under Chairman 
Robinson's uh, leadership in 2019 um, from a, a grant, not a grant, but a gift that we got from a supervisor's um, estate gave us the seed money to, um, to look out into the future. And we, as we all understand, the, uh, the majority of those who serve in conservation districts are um, in the better half of their lives and that we really needed to um, find people with a passion for conservation and to build that leadership um, mission that we have identified as our vision. So 2019 put together the Next Generation Leadership Institute with the help of Ray Leisurewood and uh, staff who spent tremendous hours of development into this program. 2020 was the first year, uh, the first class, inaugural class, which is up here today, was selected to participate in this program. And we never knew at the time that uh, this, this process for the first class would extend into 2021. That was never our intent, but COVID changed a lot of things. But I think that that was an opportunity for those working within the program, NACD and the foundation, to really try to understand what we're doing, what the ultimate goal is, and I think we've just about achieved that. And so uh, it's absolutely my honor and privilege to stand up here today and um, announce that this class is finalizing their year as cohorts and uh, it's excited. So please give me a round of applause for these individuals who's given a year and a half to develop this leadership. Aubrey. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Aubrey Evans. I am the Northern Plains Region Rep for NACD, and I am also the Program Manager, uh, newly appointed for the Next Generation Leadership Institute. And what an honor, what an honor. Um, this, this is really something for me to be able to come up here and speak after Brent Van Dyke. So thank you so much, Brent, for those comments. Okay. Getting my slides sorted here, I'm sorry, apologize. So we're gonna start out with um, a rundown of the agenda just so that you all know what to expect. Uh, we have, obviously, our welcome comments, and we're showing you our agenda right now. And then we are going to go into a cohort roundtable presentation where the cohort will actually tell you about their experiences in the leadership program. We're going to launch into some appreciation remarks for, NGL, for the NGLI, and um, then some 2022 cohort recruitment. You know we, we want to get another group of great people in here again next year. So and then we will have closing comments. So our objectives today, we want to share with you the, the member connection with the summer meeting participants through shared stories from their leadership journey before, during, and after the experience. And we also want to share our thanks to NCF, NACD, and the guest speakers that we've had over the past year and a half. So we are going to launch right off into the cohort roundtable. We're going to talk a little bit about how the experience has helped them in their leadership journey, what they have learned and what they're doing with it, their favorite sessions and how they are using those in their everyday lives, and where they started and where they are now. And we are going to lead off with Joe. Thank you, Aubrey. I appreciate that very much. Glad to be here, everyone. It's been a great opportunity and a blessing to be part of this uh, inaugural NGLI cohort. So uh, it's difficult when we're asked to uh, reflect on all the speakers and presentations and activities that we've been a part of, especially the blessing that we've had the last couple of years. But um, as an example, I'll pick one and then uh, share a couple of other comments. But you know, I, I really had a great opportunity when we went through the Myers-Briggs uh, personality profile study. I've done one of those before, but 
you know, I'm a little more mature now than when I did it back in high school, and it really helped me to, to confirm kind of my personality, the type of person I am. Then I could take that information back to my work environment, which happens to be my family as well, which was a great opportunity to reflect on how I interact with them. And then furthermore, we can take those experiences back to our local conservation districts, our state associations, and that type of thing. So it was a great learning experience for me and a growing experience as well. But I'd like to just say in general, I mean, this, this experience, I mean, what greater way for a group of people to come together and learn from one another, share. It's a trusted group of friends that we now call our family. And I mean, that was what was the most important thing for me was it was just where we could come together. We all are from different parts of the United States. Uh, a lot of different backgrounds, and yet we have similar interests in conservation, and it's just been a great opportunity for, for us to come together and share with one another and learn. So I really appreciate this opportunity. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Next up, we have Barbara Blywise. Thank you. The first thing you learn is to delegate. So I'm going to have. When asked what's the most memorable aspect of the Institute, the list is long. It's long. But as I reflect on it, it is actually the realization that this experience created by these fantastic individuals represents the past, present, and future of conservation all in one room, all at one time. It's an overwhelming experience. I actually learned that there is another state besides North Carolina, which I think. I didn't know Missouri was a state until I, <laughs> I thought it revolved around North Carolina, which it does. In every session, I learn so much and am inspired by these individuals, my sisters, my brothers, and I take comfort in the safe space that this opportunity has created to share and speak openly. All this to say that the Leadership Institute has left me with knowing that anything is achievable, anything. From the very beginning in Vegas, we were assigned reading material. So like, just like in college, you had to read up. And I was a good student in college, I sat in the front. So I was ready. Timothy Egan's book, The Worst Hard Time, literally brought me to tears reading about the destruction and the despair created by the Dust Bowl that ultimately created the districts. For the love of the land, the history of NACD, how timely to talk about it again, Coupled with the interview with Philip Glick, the lawyer that helped create the legislation that created the districts, bears witness to the glacier called federal policy of 100 years ago, the vision. But would he know that I'd be bragging on him now? You know, this, the gentleman, Mr. Glick. Did he know how much I'd be bragging, how impactful his work would be? And add to that the courage that it took for NACD to embrace urbanization and the onslaught that it has made on our earth. That took a lot of courage. And we hope to continue that courage because the fight is still going on. The Leadership Institute has empowered me with strategic tools and professional self-awareness mechanisms that help strengthen our organization from the inside out, from the top down and the bottom up. It has opened my eyes to the vast network of 3,000 conservation districts of their knowledge and experience so richly abundant and so willingly shared as I connect the reading material to my own experience and my own journey, it is very tempting to think that you kind of know how the story is going to end. But that would only be partially true, because there is so much more work to be done. We know how we got here. We know where we got to go. And we know why it's important. Being part of the Next Generation Leadership Institute is an honor. It has given me an overwhelming sense of purpose and pride in the knowledge that we're making an indelible mark on the earth, not just for today's generation, but for future generations. I am so proud to be part of NACD's journey, and I hope you will join me. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Barbara. Next, I'm gonna direct your attention to the other side of the stage, and we're gonna hear from Mark Masters. Well, good morning. Thank you. Um, you know, again, echoing just what an honor it is to be sitting uh, up, up here at this table with this, this fantastic group of folks. Um, you know, I, 
there, there's, a, there's a big part of me that, that feels very unworthy to share the stage uh, with, with these people. And I'm reminded about the kid, you know, that's, well, even though I'm cleaning cages, I'm still part of the circus. And so, you know, I, I really do feel that it's, uh, it's a blessing to me to be a part of this group and, and thank you and certainly thank the foundation. Um, as cliche as it, it, it sounds, you know, thinking about the, the questions, my favorite, my favorite session was the last one, right? Wh whichever one that happened to be. Uh, because I always take something that I can use. You know, Ray and, and the team has put together a fantastic curriculum of, of really solid nuts and bolts things that we can do to improve our own personal leadership journey, help us with our districts back home and, and all of those things which are, which are fantastic. But the thing that sort of bridges all of those is the, the leadership journey that I've made, I guess, internally is, is, is how we personalize everything. And, and it occurs to me, you know, conservation districts aren't anything. They're, they're, just, they're, they're just paper and, and organization. It, it's the people that matter, right? And so we've been able to, to learn how uh, to recognize that and uh, look to engage different people. We, we all come from very different backgrounds and different walks of life, but we're all pulling the same direction uh, for conservation. It's important that we, we realize and learn and understand that the partnerships that have been discussed over the last two days that are going to be necessary to take conservation to the next level are going to require us to work with people that we, we haven't normally, right, you know, and, and haven't in the past. And so I think the, the, um, the Institute has certainly reinforced that to me. It's given me some tools to help, you know, keep that in the, in the front of my mind. And, and just thinking about last night, uh, you know, going up a thousand feet in the air and, and looking out over the lake and the river, you know, when, when those folks gathered 75 years ago, that lake and river didn't look like it does now. There, there weren't going to be folks out there swimming in the waters of Lake Michigan, right? And so we see the results of that 75 years, and, and I, I'm, I'm proud to, to be a small glimpse into the future leaders of, of NACD uh, and hope we, can, hope we can make the next 75 years, uh, you know, that much better. And it's quite an honor to be able to speak to you all on the first day of that next 75 years. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I see we have up here next up is Cassius. He was unable to join us this morning. He had a prior commitment. I know that he wishes he could be here. Um, another fantastic, fantastic individual. I hope you all get to speak with him at some point during this, this day. So we're gonna swing back over to the other side of the stage and talk to Ryan Britt, who you may recognize from the previous session. You guys just can't get rid of me today. <laughs> I do appreciate the opportunity to stand in front of you guys or sit as it may be and, and give you the appreciation that this group has for the opportunity that you've endowed upon us. The last year and a half have not only been an opportunity for us to individually grow, but for us to start or continue that journey and how we're going to um, change or how we're going to help continue the work that has been done by many of you in conservation over the last 75 years. The, the things that have stuck out to me over this last year and a half have been, first off, just the cohort themselves. And I don't know that it, you guys can really appreciate how much we enjoy being around each other. You know, it's, it's, it's somewhat random how we got together, and yet it's not. Uh, each one of these individuals have some very strong personalities, but also have some, some great qualities that, that we build off of each other. And the more we're together, the more fun we have. I don't know that, that it, it, I can do justice in just saying that, that I appreciate each and every one of them very much and, and am excited that we have a few more days together. The sessions that, that stuck out the most to me um, actually had to do with the Noble Foundation and, and personality and culture and, and stuff that I appreciate what Joe said, and I find myself paralleling him in a lot of things in life, but um, we're both farmers and, and um, association leaders and so forth, and, and our farms are similar. We're just a state away from each other, and, and our families are similar. But um, the, the personality work and the culture work that, that was the training that was done for us 
is, is similar to what I actually had opportunities to do with other leadership programs. And I have to tell you that your investment in Sonny and Ray and now Aubrey are, are, is a very good investment and that they have done a wonderful job of putting the people in front of us to help us get to the next level that is a high caliber, unlike any of the other programs I've been involved in. I've, I've been exposed some to the cattlemen's leadership stuff, the Farm Bureau leadership stuff, the corn and soybeans. I, I went to the DuPont leaders program. So, um, and maybe if they keep thinking, if they keep putting me through enough of those, maybe something will stick. You know, I told you I'm from Missouri, I'm a little slow. <laughs> But this program is, is of a caliber that does not compare to those others. It is way above. I'm excited that Cassius is here because actually uh, I'm glad you guys are going to get to hear from him because he is one of the, th the members that, that bring exactly what I'm trying to tell you. And for me to understand the culture of what we're doing and that the, the, dif the different perspectives, how every decision we make in life and, and especially in conservation leadership or in, in the conservation policy decisions that we make, that what's going on in north central Missouri is probably a lot different than what's going on in other parts of the country. And even more importantly, what I think is really important may not make a hill of beans to somebody that's looking, what, three generations back and three generations forward for every single decision that they make. This, um, resource or this leadership institute has taken each one of us above and beyond where we could have been and where we're going to be now so i just want to thank ncf and the investment you guys have made in us i want to thank um sunny who was um leading the program with ray and 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 now with aubrey i'm just excited to finish this out strong and and just thank you so much Thank you very much, Ryan, and I am going to go ahead and back it up, and I am so thrilled that you guys get to hear from Mr. Cassius Spears today. Well, I'm going to start off saying, um, you know, our shine comes from the polish of all you guys. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's, we're just an amazing uh, team here in front of you that uh, is greatly diverse and the, the time that we had got to spend with one another to talk about the different things that are happening across the country and talk to you uh, as well, explain to us in detail and in depth what's going on nationally because we are diverse and we have to kind of pull all those, all that power I should say, all those thoughts, all those ideas, we got to pull them together uh, to a, to, into an area where we can actually work with those uh, and get something done, make some solution. Uh, I have to say, I had some time to talk to a lot of the folks out here in the audience, and I'm totally impressed. I'm, I'm impressed in how you handle yourself, your mannerism, uh, how, you, how you look at the, the challenges and make it seem like, you know, we, we, we'll get to it. You know, there may not be enough time in the day, uh, but, and we got a lot of work to do, but we'll get to it. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, last night on the way up to, to dinner, uh, I had a chance to talk with Joe, and he told me, he said, you know, it's all about balance. And, and in my culture, it is, it's, it's truly about balance. And he said, if we can balance our resources, our economics with people, we'll be doing all right. And one other thing he said to me that made me think of my, my ancestors and, and, and my family back home, is that can we truly afford resources? Because they come with a cost. The reason why the trees in Brazil are being cut down is because they have value to it. And the people there can't keep up with the value of that tree. So can they afford those resources? And we have it right here. So in order for you to keep your forest and to keep the land and keep the healthy soil, all right, we have to afford that. And to do that, we have to create some balance. And it's going to take time. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tricky balance, but you know, when you have like-minded folks and they understand that, that, that formula or that factor, we can get it done. So I, I, just have, I just don't have enough good things to say about 
the journey that we all have taken, and, um, and, we're, and we're ready. We're ready for the next level. Um, Michael Crowder, president, I mean, you, uh, when we uh, went up to the dinner and you had all the presidents, the uh, past presidents stand up, I mean, that was amazing. I mean, the, just the, the energy in the room and the knowledge. Again, in our culture and our tradition, we respect our elders and that wisdom that they carry. And to take the time to sit and talk with them and hear their stories is, was, is very rewarding to me uh, as well. So I really appreciate that opportunity to, to see that. Um, but one thing I'll have to say on a negative note is that when we was watching the slide pre presentation back in the 40s, uh, they went one person of color in those slides. And, uh, and hopefully the future will change that. And I can see the change happening already. So I'm, I'm really proud to be up here on the table and sit, sitting among this team of folks here and, and be talking to you. So thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you, Cassius. And next up, we have Sam Steiner. Hi, hi, everybody. So, like two years ago, I would never have imagined sitting up here on this stage. I was at a board meeting, and someone gave me an application and said, hey, I think this is something you really need to apply for. And to be chosen to be a part of this cohort has just been an absolutely amazing experience. Everybody up here comes from a different background. We all have different ideas but we all have one goal, and that's conservation. And um, it's just been, sorry, an absolutely incredible experience for me. So there's so many sessions that we have gone through over the last year and a half, and some that have stuck out with me is the generational conversations and personality conversations, um, and learning how to work with people um, from all different eras, all different backgrounds, and um, being able to bring all our diverse ideas together and to move forward with that. So um, what an incredible opportunity to be with everybody up here. And I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to see this program grow. I'm excited to see it spread across the country even more. And um, looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And last, but of course not least, we have Phil Campbell. Good morning, or afternoon, I should say. Um, what an honor. More than that, it's a true blessing to, to be sitting up here on this platform with these wonderful individuals. What drives us is the fact that we are all human beings and we share the same passion when it comes to conservation. Wise man told me growing up that in life, the trip that you plan may not be the journey that you take. With that being said, this has truly been a journey. I envision 12 months of leadership training, if you will, and will be done and it'll be another feather in the hat, so to speak, and uh, we're moving on to the next project, if you will. COVID comes along and changes that trip to the journey that we find ourselves on today. It's truly been a, a journey with embracing the technology that comes along with uh, operating in a COVID environment, um, I, for one, was lacking in that area. And post, if you will, COVID, I'm embracing the technology. Transitioned from a flip phone to an iPhone, and that was a huge step for me. With that being said, um, this has been a wonderful journey, wonderful experience. Hats off to the forefathers that thought enough to put this together, to stay the course, to see it to where we are right now. It's not by chance 
that we're here sitting on this stage. I have to echo what Cassius said earlier, earlier about the founders. They were a diverse group, bankers, businessmen, farmers, ranchers, but they all shared the same drive, the same compassion for conservation and the willingness to get to yes, to convince anybody and everybody that we have to get to yes, stay the course, get to yes. And I think that's what these folks up here on this stage represent. The leaders of tomorrow, how do we get to yes? Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. And now for the next little segment of our presentation here, we're gonna have a moment of appreciation um, from the NGLI cohort to the folks that helped make this happen. We're gonna start off with Joe Coughlin again. Okay, I know uh, we've got a time limitation here, so I wanna be real brief, but I wanna be very sincere as well. I think you heard from everyone up here on the panel the thanks that has already been shared. But on behalf of the 2020 cohort, we just want to sincerely and at the, from the bottom of our hearts thank NACD, especially the board and the executive board for their leadership and their support of this program. We want to thank the National Conservation Foundation, uh, their board of trustees, their executive board for their foresight uh, with, with this vision. Part of the mission of the National Conservation Foundation is to pr promote the future conservation leaders of tomorrow, and that's what this program's for. So we just really appreciate that foresight and uh, we thank you for all your contributions. We thank you for all the sponsorships. Let's keep this program going. Thank you all very much. I'd like to recognize our guest presenters and trainers. We have Phil and Cassius. I, I want to say this phrase uh, before I start and uh, you, some of you may have heard me say it already, uh, but progress moves at the speed of trust. Uh, so with that, I just want to acknowledge all the, all the folks, again, that all the different uh, meetings that I should say, Ray and, and, uh, and Audrey as well as Sonny put into place to make so we could actually uh, talk to people that uh, in, in different organizations that came in to train and help us uh, pull out our strengths. Um, I just, again, I can't say enough to the, the work that went into that to organize all of that. So in, in the time that it took to do that during, you know, during COVID and, um, and everything else that were going on in our lives. Uh, again, I have to say thank you for all of, you, all of those that, uh, that sacrifice, you know, um, the time to be here away from your families um, and, and of course work and other things that are, are happening within your life. So uh, with that, I just, I just can't thank enough for uh, the work that went into all of this to make this possible and, 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 and to keep it going for future, future generations. So thank you again. And Phil. I have to echo those comments. Um, hundreds of hours gone into doing PowerPoint presentations and sacrifice for, for families and family time. Um, a very heartfelt thank you from this group of folks for the sacrifices that were made on our behalf. So again, thank you. Okay, so next up we have Barb. <laughs> And take a few moments to tell you where our, what's our next step. We were asked by the leadership of NACD, what's, what's next, what do you want to do? Pick your passion. It was almost like pick a card, any card. And we did. We joined committees that steered us into the future. For example, Mark Masters was on uh, Groundwater, uh, the task force set up for this year. Ryan Britt with climate change. These are very important subjects, as you know, and I was recently appointed to an urban agriculture subcommittee 
to define what, what that is. There was also committees that steer us wisely through the present to get there and keep us grounded in our values. So Joe, for example, is on the policy book review committee and also district operations. And Sam Steiner and Phil both joined community conservation and also are dealing with diversity and equity. So our journey continues. We love it. We are all in. And we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Barbara. Next up, we have Sam Steiner with our locations and connectivity. As you can see on this map, um, we are located all over the country. And it would be really awesome to see in the future that more of these states change colors and more and more people get involved with this cohort and bring their knowledge to the stage and be able to share their ideas and build this leadership even greater. Um, we have been connected through our love of agriculture, our love of conservation. And um, because of our diverse backgrounds, we're able to bring all that together and hope to continue to build this leadership program and um, grow our expansion across the, the country. Thanks, Sam. Now the fun part. Mark and Ryan are gonna attempt to recruit some 2022 cohorts. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and go and, and, and let Ryan uh, put a bow on this thing. So very much like happened to us when we jumped into the first session in Las Vegas, Ray and the team put us to work right away. So I'm going to do the exact same thing to everybody in this room. So I would be willing to bet that if not 100%, 99% of y'all have within arm's reach one of these, and they're connected to that Internet thing that Katie Couric talked about on the, on the video a while ago, right? So if, if we're really serious about putting the right next seven people in the seats that we are now in next year, next summer in Puerto Rico, I believe, if we're serious about that, we, we need your help in recruitment. Because if you were in the session yesterday afternoon, we talked about, yes, it's very, very important that we have fantastic NACD staff that gets messages out. The communication team does a fantastic job. We have folks like Candace and Keith and regional representatives that get the information out. But I'm telling you, there is no more important thing in terms of recruitment than a note or a text or a call from you as supervisors and respected leaders. If you're in this room, you know, edging up on lunch with as beautiful as it is outside, you're already a conservation advocate. And so now I'm formally deputizing you as a NGLI broker and recruiter. So get your phone out. Some of you are already on it. I see you doing the iPhone prayer. You know, we got it. <laughs> get your phone out. If we'll put the, uh, we put the slide up. Um, Aubrey? Mm. All right. We get your phone it. out. Get the text. Get your text message app out and going. Y'all ready? All right. Text to the number 844-744. 0918. You, all right, so you're going to text to that number, to that phone number, 844 744 0918. And you're going to text the message NGLI 2022. That's what we're recruiting for. NGLI 2022. Hit send. You're going to get a little note back that I typed out a few days ago that says, hey, I'm here in Chicago. I just heard a great presentation from the NGLI. I think you'd be a great addition to that next class. You doing that will go much further than us talking about it, than staff talking about it, than getting an email from, from NACD or your local district. I encourage you to do that. Even if you don't take the text I put together and send it, get the link, use it to recruit. If you're flying home, Delta has free messaging on their flights, right? Get this word out. Uh, a note from you goes an awful long way. And again, thank you for, uh, for, for sticking around with us for your attention and your support of NGLI. All right. Well, once again, I find myself at the end of the program and trying to sum up what other people have said. Uh, Mark did a wonderful job recruiting you, and I really appreciate his advancement with the technology there and uh, taking care of that uh, texting. What, a, what an easy way for you to encourage somebody else to get involved in the program. I challenge you also to consider is 
to challenge other people to find a program with better value than what this program has been. Each one of us have grown, gained so much. We want to um, open ourselves up to each one of you so that if you have somebody that is interested that's just not sure, I know every single one of us would be glad to tell somebody that was a potential NGLI cohort just our, about our experience, what we've done, why they should do it, and if anything, we might even give them a little you know, kick in the rear. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been great to be with you here today, and I'll, I'll just get out of the way here. And, and, and as we are closing this up, once again, we want to lift up Aubrey, Ray, Sonny, and NCF, and all the work that's been done for us. We appreciate it so much. Thank you all for your attention. I did want to point out Ray Ledgerwood sitting over here. We would be remiss if we did not recognize him for all of his vast contributions to this program. So. And finally, we do have some closing comments from Jeremy. Thanks, Aubrey. Thanks, members of the, the cohort. Wow, what a, a great panel. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you on, on behalf of both NACD and the foundation uh, to e each of the, the cohort members. Um, th this last year, you all have displayed what, what I uh, regard as just excellent leadership in not only uh, participating in the program so dedicatedly and thoroughly, but just your, uh, your, your optimism, your tenacity, your uh, ability to, to stick with it. I know it's not been the, the year that we uh, uh, originally promised you, but, uh, but we're getting things back on track. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, from, from the bottom of my heart to, to each of you uh, for your participation and, and your, your leadership. And I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. As we, we're in Chicago, as, as we've been uh, celebrating our 75th anniversary, uh, thinking about our past leaders, recognizing our, our current leaders, what a great way to end our program with some thoughts from our future leaders. So let's give them all another big round of applause. And as we wrap, I also uh, wanted to uh, uh, just uh, mention a few of our upcoming meetings. We've got uh, a great uh, roster of, of meetings coming up for 2022 and 23 uh, next uh, February. Uh, February 22, we're going to be in Orlando, Florida for our annual meeting, so make plans to join us in sunny Florida uh, next February. The, the timing should be great for that. Um, also, next summer, as mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to be uh, going to San Juan, Puerto Rico uh, for the uh, NACD Summer Conservation Forum and Tour. It's going to be held in conjunction with the Southeast Region meeting. So uh, we, we just finalized those uh, details a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm very pleased to announce uh, that, that we'll be going to, to Puerto Rico uh, uh, next July. And then uh, for 2023, we're going to do a redo of our uh, meeting plans that, that we had in store for, uh, for 2020. Uh, we're going to be going to uh, New Orleans for our 2023 uh, annual meeting, and we'll be going to Bismarck, North Dakota for the uh, 2023 Summer Conservation Forum and Tour. So look forward to all those uh, events, mark your calendars, make plans, and I look forward to seeing you there. I want to turn things over to, to Michael Crowder. He's got a few uh, closing comments, and uh, then we'll let you go. So, Ray, is it Phil or Mark or Sam or Cassius or Ryan or Barbara or Joe? Who's going to be first as the next NACD president from this group? <laughs> that, that's a... I don't, I don't know. So... Thank you all for what you do. Every, every one of these folks are on some type of committee, RPG. They will be moving up, so I promise you you'll see these faces again. And it's an honor to have you here. Recruit another equally good group. So we've come to the end. I wish everybody safe travels. It's been a great meeting. We feared the worst, and we 
I think we got the best. It was, it was very good. So I sincerely thank you. It's been an honor to, I have six months in, I got another year and a half and it's such an honor to do this. And, and I appreciate everybody and I consider every one of, of these folks and everybody out there friends. So thank you all, appreciate it.